We're talking here with Frederick Spaulding of Indianapolis, Indiana, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, can you start us off with some background on yourself? Uh, to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, 9 April 1940. Okay. And did you grow up in Indianapolis? Oh yeah, born and raised there, and I'll probably die here. All right. Uh, and uh, what kind of schools did you go to? I went to uh, grade school PS78, located at Sherman Drive in Vermont Street. We called it Mini Hartman High, but then I went to Tech for two and a half years, high school. And then they changed the boundary. And originally, my house sat on the boundary line. So when they changed the boundary, then I had to go to another school, which was Howe High School. Howe was closer anyway. But uh, anyway, I went to Howe and finished up there and graduated in 1957. Okay. Now, while you were growing up, what did your family do for a living? And my dad was a printer. We were printing at the start and at the Times. My mother was just a housewife. Okay. All right. Uh, and then what did you do once you finished high school? I worked for about a year and then I went into service. I went to enlist in uh, June of 1958. Uh, I went to the Marine Corps where my uncle uh, was serving World War II. And uh, I went in to see the uh, recruiter and he was on the telephone with his sitting back with feet up on the desk eating a sandwich. And when he asked me what I wanted and I told him, he says, uh, you know, something about get out of here, you're not big enough to be a Marine, you're nothing but a piss ant, blah, blah, blah. Which I didn't think he was serious, but he was. I went down the hall rather dejected around the corner and was walking down the hallway of the Federal Building there and there was this big old Master Sergeant Army and he'd evidently, he had enough stripes on his arm there. He'd been in World War II, or World War One, World War Two, Korea, he'd been in all of them. And, uh, he asked me what happened, and I told him, he said, well, how dare you, you look like a fine specimen of manhood to me, step right in here. And I went in and had all these posters all over the wall, and the one poster that jumped out was these guys coming down in parachutes. And on the ground they were running, and they had a very determined look on their face, and uh, knives stuck in their boots, and Thompson submachine guns, it just... I mean, the proper thing to grab an 18-year-old's mm -hmm. attention, you see. And uh, he asked, now, he said, well, what can we do for you? I said, I want to be that right there. And across the bottom, he said, Rangers lead the way. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. So he looked at the poster, and he looked back at me, and he said, this poster right here? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I said, well, he looked me up and down again. He said, my, we have our work cut out for us now, don't we? And I had no idea what he was talking about, but years later when I retired, uh, about six months after I retired, I received all of my files. They put them on microfiche and sent me all the originals. My original physical was in there. I was five foot five, weighed 128 pounds. I guess I was a piss ant about that. <laughs> but, uh, Anyway, it was a very good life. I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky for uh, basic training and then on down to Fort Benning, Georgia for uh, advanced individual training infantry. Then from there, I got on a bus with 126 other guys and we went to Fort Bragg. We was going to be originally assigned in the 504 and be the replacements because they were gyroing to Germany at that time. However, we got there late. They'd already gone. So I was reassigned to 325. Uh, we went to jump school right there, and it was five weeks long in those days. Now, it was 325, if you go back to World War II days, that was the glider regiment? They were the for glider the... regiment for the 82nd. All right, but at this point, they're all, you all get jump training? They were all, you know, was, everything was parachutes. Okay. Yeah, they did away with gliders, I think, in the late 40s. I'm not really sure about the okay. dates, but somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. uh, has something to do when the Air Force became, instead of Army Air Corps, became the United States Air Force in September 47. Mm -hmm. I think on a kind of gliders, fixed wing, so that they were gone. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, it was with 325, his first airborne battle group, Echo Company, first 325. And uh, my company commander was a first lieutenant by the name of Fisher, Peter J. Fisher, which I ran into years later in Vietnam. He was a lieutenant colonel. And I was a captain, so it was 
kind of goes around, comes around, I guess. But anyway, I uh, had uh, three years there. and uh, I'd like to uh, go back a little bit. Uh, you said when you enlisted, you know, they, they, the man said they, you had their work cut out for you. What was your experience like uh, in the various training that you got? Boot camp, AIT, jump school, what was... Well, it's one thing that I've never been able to understand with the Army. All the skinny guys gain weight, all the fat guys lose weight, and we're all eating the same thing. And I've never been able to understand it. Uh, with my bunch, there was four of us or five of us, I can't remember now, that they would get us up at one o'clock in the morning down to the mess hall. And we would either eat a bowl of bananas and milk or a bowl of those old brown plastic bowls of mashed potatoes and milk and, and cold. <laughs> I've, got, I've got this aversion to eating mashed potatoes to this day since then. But anyway, I picked up, I don't know, 20, 30 pounds. I came out of basic uh, going, to, uh, going to Benning about 145 pounds. And when I got out of Benning and going to, going to Fort Bragg, I was about 155, 160 pounds. All right. Now, do they also put you, try to give you any extra PT or effort to build you up, or did that just come naturally? No, it just came, it just came with it. Mm -hmm. um, now, it was kind of a, when I got to Bragg, uh, I was still kind of the smallest one. So I got the um, M1919 A6 air-cooled gas-operated machine gun. So you got the biggest weapon? I got the biggest one. So I had to tote that baby around for everywhere we went, jump in with and everything. But uh, being in 325 was, was uh, a very fortunate thing for me because when I first went in, in the 50s, uh, late 50s, there was all the personnel that we had in the uh, in Echo Company, all the sergeants and officers had already been in combat, every one of them. Uh, all my squad leaders, my platoon sergeant, first sergeant, they had all been to World War II in Korea. Well, some of the squad leaders hadn't been to World War II, but they mm -hmm. all was in Korea. Uh, the officers we had was all World War II. Our company commander uh, was World War II. And uh, then later on, um, the XO, I think, was, he was an enlisted man in World War II, got a direct commission, went to uh, Korea. Maybe he got his direct commission there, I don't remember. But uh, they was all combat-oriented, and that's the way they trained you. It is none of this, well, don't worry about it, we'll get it tomorrow. No, you do it right the first time. But in those days, well, when we got on a training exercise, it was like 30 days in the field, 30 days on maintenance, and then 30 days on post support, guard duty, mm -hmm. whatever. And during that 30 days training, you would uh, get all your gear, go down to uh, green ramp, get on airplanes, and you fly off to places like Fort Gordon, Georgia, and jump in and walk back to Fort Bragg and take every hill, cross every stream. Even though there was a bridge right down there, you had to cross the stream here. And uh, like Charlie Thrasher, he's, he was the biggest complainer we had. Great guy. Everybody loved him. They said we couldn't use the bridge. We had to cross over here. Charlie would, what do you mean we can't use the bridge? sitting right there and you know he walk out and jump on it there's nothing wrong with this bridge and uh, then he mumbled to himself about the, the damn army blah 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 but anyway but he kept everybody's morale up with this but we had uh, pretty good training in those days it was uh, the sergeants would call you up to the front and give you the map and say we are here because of this, that, was whatever they pointed out. They said, I want to go here, which is three, four miles up the road, and they give you the map. Then you had to get there. And the biggest thing in the military then, well, one of the biggest things, was map reading, land navigation. If you couldn't get from point A to point B, you're, you're not going to complete your mission. So uh, training was quite extensive in the classroom. Uh, then you go out in the practical application phase of it, and it got to the point where even the lowest PFC could read that map just like that, no problem. Which came out years later to be kind of very, very advantageous for us. But uh, uh, 325 was great, 61, 
I started to get out. I came home to see what the prospects were, and all my high school buddies was working at Western Electric in the Ford plant. And a big thing to them was uh, getting a six pack of beer and riding around on Friday night. And I was thinking that uh, we did that in high school. I was, you know, what's the big thing here? So I went back and re enlisted and uh, went to Korea. And uh, by this time I was a staff sergeant. And I was pulled out, of, I was with the first cab in Korea. I was on the uh, first, well, first off, I when I got off the the boat, uh, which was a long. What kind of ship did they have you on? Uh, God, Barrister, the USS Barrister. It was a troop ship, a okay. Liberty ship. Uh, I think it was designed for like 400, and they had 1,800 on it or something. But I don't know. But uh, this old master sergeant grabbed me when we was first getting on and said, "You're going to be my sergeant of the guard for the ship." So that got us up here rather than down in the hole with everybody else. Okay. Now, had you actually made sergeant by this time? Oh, yeah. I was staff sergeant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, anyway, uh, we got to Korea, we got off the boat, and everybody of a certain height, a certain weight, was over here. And this one uh, captain come through, and a, a first sergeant, and they was, you know, okay, you, you come, you. You, you, and I had no idea what it was, but what it was, was we got on trucks, and wound up over uh, Seoul, the Yongsan compound, and we had just become part of the United Nations Honor Guard, and uh, did that for oh gosh, two or three months, and then we were shipped up to the first uh, cab, uh, Honor Guard at uh, Camp How. And uh, they wanted to start their honor guard, so they took the youngest ones that we had up there, which was me. And we got up to uh, Camp Owls and became, uh, or started the uh, first cavalry division honor guard. And okay. what basic duties did the honor guard have to perform in these places? Oh, uh, anytime they had a visiting dignitary. Well, in the United Nations Honor Guard, every Friday night we had to lower the flag, fire the cannon, march, pass and review, and out. And, in. and also, there at the United Nations Honor Guard, 8th Army Headquarters was right across the street, and they had all the dignitaries in the world coming in and out of there. And every time there was, then we had a big parade. We'd have two or three a day uh, sometimes. But we had to change uniforms every time, mm -hmm. boots every time. But uh, and it was first cab. We didn't have that much to do except uh, on Friday nights they had the you know ceremony for the retreat, roll the bugle, and uh, anytime we had the visiting Eighth Army commander come up, then we had to do the same thing again. But uh, we were uh, my, myself and um, gosh, I don't remember his name. One other guy was pulled out of there, and uh, we just had orders to report to uh, 8th Army uh, G3. And we went down there and we had orders for uh, Vietnam. And nobody had ever heard of Vietnam in then. So uh, this was like November, December of 62. And they finally found it on the map. The map they had said Indochina didn't say anything mm -hmm. about Vietnam. So. Anyway, we finally got there, and we were assigned to the 42nd Armored Ranger Parachute Battalion out of Bucktown. And uh, we went on, I think it was like five or six different little excursions over toward the Cambodia border in the Parrot Beak area, what they call the Parrot Beak. If you take off from uh, Bucktown and you head, just, <coughs> you go just north of Saigon, mm -hmm. and you're heading due west. The river runs like a horseshoe right there, mm -hmm. and that was where we always flew over and then bounced which one did one way or the other. That was a, like a reference point to which way they're going to take their asthmas to go. Mm -hmm. And if we went this way, we knew we was going to be in a firefight somewhere. If we went this way, we knew we were just going to be out walking looking, because they were all down over here. <coughs> but anyway, uh, we got in several pretty good firefights. Okay. 
I want to again kind of stop and kind of fill in a little bit. The time you spent up in Korea, uh, would you have preferred to have an assignment other than the honor guard, or were you not even thinking about that? I wasn't really thinking about it uh, at that time because I figured if I, you know, I'm staying in, I'm going to be having plenty of opportunities mm -hmm. to be on the line. Okay. Uh, and like I told the, the honor guard thing, you know, I really would prefer to be up on the DMZ because mm -hmm. I'm infantry. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Right. And they said, well, yeah, but we want you here, blah, 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 you know. And then, like, a couple of these older NCOs would, would tell me, he says, you're going to get plenty of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Don't you worry about that. But right now, we need you here. Just, like, set the example, you know, for the young ones and all. Did you learn things while being with the Honor Guard, just in terms of how the, the Army worked or other things worked or political stuff that wound up being useful? Well, yeah, it, it was very useful. Uh, because we was around the headquarters, we, we, our main function, even other than the uh, honor guard routines, the various ceremonies you had to do, we, we was the bodyguard for the commanding general mm -hmm. and the headquarters. That was our main function up there. And the same way the United Nations uh, honor guard, uh, our function was we was the guards that stood outside the door of the commanding general and the, ballot, or the staff and all the headquarters there. We to take, take care of all that. All right, so you basically you got to meet people and learn something about how they operated. Oh yeah, yeah. When you stand out at the guard in a pray dress, standing outside the door, you can hear everything going on behind you. <laughs> a lot of times I was thinking, my God, how did he get three stars? <laughs> you know. But anyway, um, it, it was very enlightening for a young man to be standing there listening to all this because they, they were discussing, you know, war policies. Especially there in Korea, mm -hmm. uh, there was a couple of times when they had the uh, various United Nations uh, officers in from different countries in the war room. Then we'd have to be inside the war room and outside the war room. We had guards on mm -hmm. both levels, and a lot of times I got to be inside, and that was interesting watching the maps and looking mm -hmm. how they're doing and all this. It, it came in pretty handy later. All right. Now, when you got down to Vietnam, uh, describe a little bit or characterize the uh, Arvin Battalion that you were serving with. It was the uh, 42nd Arvin Ranger Parachute Battalion, and they were some tough little people. They'd already been in combat for I don't know how long. Um, some of these uh, guys we had, uh, they had fought against the Japanese in World War II. And they had been fighting against the Viet Minh, mm -hmm. uh, that which later became the Viet Cong. So had some of them served alongside the French when the French were still right. trying to hang on? These, these were tough guys. Yeah. Very, I mean, a little, but they were tough. But uh, I had first company, and we went on this one big operation. Um, in those days, you cannot be really assigned there. We were TDY from Korea, okay? Mm -hmm. We still wore our first cab patches. We didn't wear the K-Mag patch or the V-Mag patch. Mm -hmm. um, so our order said TDY 179 days, and the reason the way I understood it was that if you was assigned there, then you know, like for a year, then the strength level would go up. If you're there TDY, the mm -hmm. strength level would not go up. So therefore, you really, in a sense, didn't count against the strength level because you're just TDY. And the TDY is just temporary duty or detached. Yeah, duty. temporary yeah. duty. Yeah, but. Uh, we went out on this last operation. Uh, we went on, like, we had five or six operations we went on. Two of them was nothing. Uh, a couple of them was pretty good with firefights, which is, you know, you're still learning mm -hmm. all this. This is what your job is. And then the last one uh, I went on was just, it was a full fledged ball buster. I mean, it was, boy, they had everything going. The entire battalion was out. And they had another battalion somewhere mile or two up the road up that way. But the bulk of my battalion was in here. My first company was out here. And then there was, I think, second company, and then uh, three, four, and five in the headquarters was landed out there. Well, they went in the wrong place, I think, because they were getting hit with everything. And then second company went, you know, to help, and they was blocking this side. First company, we went up this way, 
and the tree line, the way the tree line was, and I was thinking that somebody should have peppered that tree line before we went in because that's where all the fire was coming mm -hmm. from. So I took my company, went this way, and we got on line and started, you know, skirmish line and started going through. The enemy that day must have been asleep because they had no flank security out. Yeah. We, we just rolled them right up. All they, right. They, now, the, were, did you basically recommend the maneuver to the company commander, or did he come up with that himself? Or? Well, yes and no. I had the radio okay. talking to the battalion advisor, mm -hmm. and I'm on the frequency. I've listened to all the mm -hmm. different advisors, what's going on with where where. And I knew from where the fire was coming from, I could see that, you could hear it also. I'm thinking, well, our best bet is to go over this way and then come this way, because mm -hmm. if we come up this way, we're going to be getting fire from our own people. Right. And we're, we need to come up this way and, you know, hit them from this flank. Mm -hmm. Anytime you can flank somebody and hit them with infrared fire, that's the best way yep. to go. But I basically just from asking how the command process works, because officially you're just there in an advisory capacity. Right. And it's going to be the Vietnamese officers who are giving the orders. Mm -hmm. And so how does the, that dynamic actually work? Well, you know, I recommend, mm -hmm. oh, if at the same time you're recommending, you're pointing and doing this, mm -hmm. blah, 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 then the interpreter's firing it through to the guy. Most of the time, well, the captain I had could speak pretty good English mm -hmm. anyway, so we had no problem. Um, so anyway, we got online, mm -hmm. swept through, uh, had our flanks out on the left just to make sure, and uh, bang, we walked right up behind them. Not a one of us looking our way, and we just. Now, what kind of troops were you fighting? I mean, were these people that... Viet men, uh, which, like I say, later became Viet Cong. Right. Uh, they had no at that time uh, in the early '60s, like that. They had no. Hardcore NBA uh, units there. That was all uh, Viet men and Viet well, Viet Cong. Yeah, or, yeah. Anyway, uh, we rolled them up and uh, annihilated them, where they were totally ineffective. And then the battalion advisor after that, uh, he recommended myself and uh, the guy from Second Company, and I never can remember his name for some reason. Uh, recommended us for direct battlefield commissions, which I turned it down. Uh, in those days, officers were held in very high esteem, mm -hmm. and I did not feel I had the education to be an officer. So when our, we went back in, did the after-action report, the briefing, blah, 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 and everything. And uh, about a week later is when I'm heading back to Korea. And I get back, and back to mold duties and all that kind of stuff. Um, which I had volunteered at that time to go up to the DMZ and get a rifle squad or a platoon. And they said, no, well, right now we got this coming, blah, 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 back and forth, and all this other stuff. So and I got back in time for a competition for the non commissioned officer of the year. And uh, I went to that, which being with the United Nations Honor Guard and hearing all the stuff that was going on and then being in Vietnam with the advisory staff mm -hmm. and listening to how they all planned all this stuff. When I got in front of the board for the um, NCO of the year, everything just kind of fell into place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was designated NCO of the year for 1st Cavalry Division 1963. But Anyway, uh, after that, I came back to the States, and my officers went back to the 82nd, and the officers back there, after about three, four, five months, all this stuff starts catching up with you, paperwork mm -hmm. on it. And they were pushing me to go to OCS and take a direct commission, you know, all mm -hmm. this kind of stuff, and I you know, didn't do that. So when I mentioned the education thing, because the company commander called me in and for that asked me, what is the problem? Mm -hmm. He said, you've already demonstrated you know what you're doing, you know, on a battlefield. Uh, and I told him I don't have the education. He said, that's simple, we'll go to night school. So which I started going to night school. And that was working pretty well. And after about two months, the, uh, well, I used to go in at about a half hour to an hour early mm -hmm. every night just to go through everything, make sure I had everything ready well. 
I went in early one evening and the professor was sitting there early. And he says, I'm glad you're here, Sergeant Spaulding. He says, I need to talk with you. I says, oh, okay, you know, what, what can I do? And he says, I think you're wasting your time. And I guess the look on my face was just, you know, because I thought, my God, am I that bad? <laughs> but anyway, he says, no, 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 no. He says, uh, it's, it's quite obvious, he says, you're very well read. He says, what I want to do is I just want to test you out. He says, we're going to give you this for two or three weeks and then we'll test you out. So that's what we did and I wound up out of there in about seven, eight months and had my degree and turned apply for OCS. Had my E7 orders in one hand and OCS orders in the other. And I, if I take the OCS orders and not the E7 orders, then my buddy, Tom Thornton gets the E7 stripe, which mm -hmm. he is married and had kids. I wasn't, mm -hmm. so I needn't have that. I'll take this. Mm -hmm. And I went to OCS. Graduated June 67, class 36, 67. And where did you do the OCS? What did I do? Where did you do it? Bennett, Fort Bennett. Okay. And uh, very uh, lucky. Uh, either that or I irritated a lot of people, one or two. The, uh, they have a thing called student council president. You're like the acting company commander. You work in consonance with the TAC officers and the company commander. And uh, I uh, was elected student council president, which I had no idea what I was doing. I had enough problems just keeping up with the classes. And, uh, and six months later, I was still the student council president, which the regimental commander told us that that was the first time that he's ever seen that the same person is the student council president at the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. It's most time that you know, they get fired or, or they drop out or they get kicked <laughs> out or whatever. But anyway, uh, that worked out pretty good. In the 55th company uh, class, today we have reunions started about three years ago. We have reunions all the time and one of the guys uh, gosh Mike uh, he lives in Friday Harbor Washington uh, begins with an H I can't think of his last name but anyway he got together with the rest of the guys when they found out that I was alive and uh, nominated me for the Infantry S Hall of Fame so I went into the Infantry OCS Hall of Fame in 2007, I believe it was, and uh, very exciting. Very now, exciting. what did they emphasize or focus on in, in the OCS training? What were the main well back then? Well, it's a lot different than it is now. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was infantry, mm -hmm. and uh, you were taught, you know, second lieutenant, first lieutenant, company commander. Okay, when you get out of that you can go to infantry officers advanced course that's when you learn how to be a major mm -hmm. staff officer right. plus you're learning uh, like an s3 battalion brigade and you're learning all the maps and plans mm -hmm. and your right flank is in berlin your left flank is in uh, yeah what is that up there somewhere in holland mm -hmm. amsterdam and then you're going this way uh, and you learn a lot of logistics right and op orders a lot, a lot of that, plus it's a tactics mm -hmm. thing. And then um, after that's command general staff college, that's when you learn up to the division mm -hmm. and army level, and then you go to war college and you're looking at, you know, one yep. over the world. Right. But, um, but at uh, this point though, this original infantry OCS, this yeah. is sort of how to lead a platoon or a company. Platoon company, mainly yeah. company. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now, and that was 26 weeks long. Nowadays, I think it's eight weeks long or 10 weeks long, and it's uh, branching material. Mm -hmm. You just learn how to be an officer. That's what it is. And then you go to your branch training. Like, if you're going to go infantry, you go to infantry officer basic course. Or if you're going to go SEMO, you go to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, to SEMO school. And armor, you go mm -hmm. wherever. Yeah. Well, actually, it can be a Fort Benning now. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, in artillery, you go somewhere else, and stuff like that. But right. anyway, it's all basically there. Okay, so it's a really pretty extended course at the time that you took it. Tom and I took it. It was 26 weeks long, and it was uh, you 
you go through various phases. First off, you start off your you know, like your basic, and then you uh, you get two thirds of the way through, and you turn blue. You turn black in there somewhere, and you turn blue, and then uh, uh, you graduate. Mm -hmm. So when did you graduate? 22 June 1967. Okay. Can't yeah. get away from this June. You know? All right. But now, by this time, things had, had heated up a lot in, in Vietnam. Yes. It's no longer just some advisors yeah. of the Arvins now. There's a lot of, uh, over the course of the time that when you were kind of back in, in the States in these different assignments, did, did you feel like you, you wanted to go back and get into that, or? Well, I wanted a rifle company. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a company commander. When okay. I wanted. But backing up before I got to OCS mm -hmm. in 1965, the 82nd Airborne Division went into the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that the 82nd Airborne Division, as a division, went into combat since World War II. Mm -hmm. We took the airfield, and then we were going to go down to the Dorte Bridge, go across the Dorte Bridge, split the city in half this way, link up with the Marines who was uh, guarding the embassy. And uh, I was selected to be the point man to go that night because for the last year and a half I had been the senior instructor at the 82nd Airborne Raider Detachment School, mm -hmm. which is a mini ranger course, and that's what we taught, patrolling. You know. So when we got up there, the 508 was supposed to be the first element to cross. The 508 had no one in their unit. That had any combat experience. So they called us 325 up. Colonel McDonald was the first sergeant in Korea, got a battlefield commission, and he's now our battalion commander. He already had battlefield experience, World War II, Korea. Mm -hmm. So they made our battalion the lead battalion. And then he, he was asking, you know, he says, Who do we have? And he said, Well, sir, he says, uh, he, he says We got uh, Sergeant Spaulding, he's a ranger, he's a ranger instructor. We've got uh, Sergeant Williams, he just come out of Ranger School two weeks ago. We got Sergeant Blizzard, he's Ranger qualified. I mean, our company had four Rangers, mm -hmm. which is just unheard of. Usually you're lucky if you get one per rank for a company. So he says, all right, bring them forward. So and we moved our company up, which is Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 325. Had the Jeep on this our end of the bridge, not a light on anywhere in the city, shooting going on everywhere. Uh, anyway. He gave us a briefing on the bridge, showing this is the map, this is where I want you to go, this way, that way, and you come to this, there's a fountain, turn right, go this way, blah, 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 and I'm thinking, oh boy, this is going to be good. So when we finished the briefing, he says, are there any questions? I said, yes, sir, I got one. I says, are there any friendlies on the other side of that bridge? And he said, no. And then he turned around and looked, and we turned around and looked to see what he was, because he looked this way. And there was uh, General York, the Panning General of the 82nd Airborne Division, and the Chief of Staff, and the uh, Deputy Commander. And they kind of conferred, and they said, no, there's no friendlies on the other side of that bridge. To which, and I've always wanted to say this, because it is the trademark of the Rangers. I said, okay, Williams, let's go. I said, Rangers lead the way. I said, I'll be on the right, you stay 30 yards behind me on the left. And don't you dare fire across to my side of the bridge. So anyway, down we cost. Blizzard was the uh, contact man. He kept his eye on William. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the platoon was another 30, 40 yards back behind him. And we had radios. I was talking back and forth. Now, uh, one little historical fact. Like I said earlier, that was the first time that the 82nd Airborne Division went into combat since World War II. I was the first man across the bridge. First one through the city as an enlisted man. The very first officer was our platoon leader coming across there. It was Barry R. McCaffrey, four stars. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was four stars. Anyway, uh, we got through the city this way, that way, and uh, we was coming up out of the warehouse area where there's no doors, no windows, all walls, and we're kind of caught in a tunnel like here and here's all this hollering and carrying on, and here come about 40, 50 rebels marching around, not marching, but mm -hmm. coming across a big mob, and they were chanting all kind of stuff and everything, and I'm getting ready to, you know, give them a burst, 
and they had five or six, 10, 12, 11 year old kids with them. And not all of them had weapons, and none of the kids had weapons. And I'm thinking, if we start spraying, because it's dark, the flash, you're going to get blindness, so you're just going to spray everybody, and it's going to hit one of them kids. Now, I don't mind shooting somebody who's got a weapon, but I'm not going to shoot a kid. So I didn't fire, and they walked around on my, they kept looking at me. Well, hell, I wasn't 15 feet from them, and they just kept looking at me. I'm sitting there, you know, holding right at them, waiting. If they fired, then I'd have fired, but they didn't fire. And they just kept looking back like, is that somebody standing there? And they kept on going. But anyway, we went on down across this way, that way, and wound up where we were supposed to go. And Colonel Mack was happy. So and this group kind of went past the rest of your unit, presumably, and just kept going? No, no, going? no. These, they were well, going, going somewhere this else. way. We're oh, going okay. this way. So you're just crossing paths. Yeah. Okay. At a uh, junction there. Mm -hmm. But I radioed back. You know, and they only went down a couple of blocks. Then I radioed that in too. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, we went this way, and everybody mm -hmm. got where we were supposed to go. Right. And then four months, I think five months, something like that. Uh, we got our company got on planes and flew back to Bragg. So how did you spend your time over the next several months? Oh, on rooftops, uh, setting up 50 cal machine guns on rooftop, guarding different. Junctions and mm -hmm. highways and stuff. We had to block off the city where, and we pushed them down. They had the river behind them, and we just kind of blocked them and then pushed them. Now they're all trapped in there and they can't come out. Mm -hmm. It was General Camacho, I believe, was the rebel commander. And uh, anyway, now, did they ultimately surrender? Or? Oh yeah. 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 Now, was there much actual fighting in terms of? Yeah, we lost twelve. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had something like a hundred. 15, 16 wounded, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, they had like a little tank, more like an armor mm -hmm. thing, and it come wheeling around and we blew that thing to pieces with a 106, and that was a bit overkill. Mm -hmm. uh, they had like a big gunboat running up and down the river out there firing at us, so we took a 106 round of that thing and it just disappeared. Now, had a sniper up in a church steeple. We took him out. And then we had several on the street that we took out. Mm -hmm. Now once you've essentially taken over, uh, what was sort of the mood of the population there as far as you could tell? What well, it, well, at first there were several of them that didn't really particularly care to have us around. But uh, once we were there, found out that we wasn't the villains that they've been led to believe. Um, you know, give candy to the kids. We set up with our medics, we set up mm -hmm. health clinics mm -hmm. and stuff, and our doctors, and they just started checking all the people. If you can win the kids, mm -hmm. the parents will follow them. You know, cause, uh, you know, we wasn't there to hurt them. In the meantime, you maintain discipline, so you're not acting like maybe oh, some no, other own no, police yeah. or military might have. Yeah. Well, we had formations and uh, you know strict, you know, platoon formation, you know, and all this kind. And people were watching, mm -hmm. and so they you know, they recognized that they were uh, you know highly trained, well disciplined mm -hmm. group, not just a bunch of yo-yos running around shooting their guns off. Right. So that went over rather well. Got back and went back to being an instructor down at Raider School, mm -hmm. and then uh, went in front of the E7 board and got that, and you know, went to OCS. And, okay. And now, did you do your original uh, Ranger training back in your first hitch when you were at Fort Bragg, or is that right. okay? Yeah. So no, no, we went to Benning, Fort Benning, Georgia, for Ranger School. Oh, okay. But that was before you had gone to Korea and Vietnam, or was it after you got back from those places? Yeah. Right. When I got back. From uh, Korea, uh, 63, it went straight to Ranger School. Okay, let's fit that into the sequence at the right place. Yeah. Okay, uh, so now you, you get out of OCS and that got us to 67. Mm -hmm. All right. Went to Spatial Forces, was assigned to Spatial Forces. Uh, well, Spatial Forces, well, I was assigned to Spatial Forces TDRI 
in route to Okinawa, TDY to uh, Monterey Peninsula Language School, the DLIWC, Defense Language Institute, West Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, went in there and took Korean. And I thought, well, this is going to be something. I'm going to have to go to school to learn how to speak English because Korean was 100% grammatically correct, and nobody I know speaks English that is grammatically <laughs> correct. So I had a lot of trouble with, uh, with Korean, and uh, we had tests every day, every week, every month on what we had during that period, and then quarterly and all that. And then come down to the end of the year, you have a whole big thing, and it's uh, audio and visual. You read it and write it, mm -hmm. and then you sit there and listen, and you write out what it is. And all through the entire year, all my tests were poor and failing, poor and failing, poor and failing. And I thought, well, I'm never going to get through this thing. And it, it would kind of hurt because every school I'd ever been to, I'd always been first or second, always, every military school I've been to. But that was more of a physical, knowledgeable thing. This was sitting behind the desk with yep. and it just it wasn't my bag. So anyway, uh, finally got through, and just before about a week, we're going to graduate in a week, but we're going to be taking the test. I think it was like on a Thursday or Friday, and then you had a long weekend to pack and clear mm -hmm. post and all the other stuff, and then you graduate the following week. Well, my father passed away, so I had to hop on a plane, run home, attend the funeral and everything, and then by the time I come back, majority of everybody's already gone, mm -hmm. and then I got to sit down and take the test. That was a lot of fun. But when I come through, uh, after I got through with the test, I missed only like four or five questions on the uh, audio mm -hmm. and uh, only like three or four questions on the video. And I told him, I said, well, that can't be right. I said, I just, you know, and he said, well, no, he says, this is the Oriental way of thinking. No, she said, it's in there somewhere. You just, you know, hit it, bang, bang, mm -hmm. it's, it's there. So anyway, uh, cleared post, back with stuff, uh, went back in and that was, well, went back to Bragg, mm -hmm. and then uh, went to uh, SFOC, uh, advanced course, first basic course and stuff. <sighs> when I went back in and that was dropped the car off, got on the plane, went to Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Got to Okinawa, uh, Colonel Rowe, uh, made captain on the way, and uh, had orders for a buddy of mine who was in my OCS class. So when I got off the plane, they already knew I was coming. So mm -hmm. when I got off the plane, here he is. I got his orders to captain. He's still standing there with the first lieutenant mm -hmm. on. And I thought this is going to be a lot of fun. So anyway, he says, My God, where are Captain Mars going? Oh, my God. I says, uh, my God, sir, <laughs> pick up my bag, you know, and uh, we had a blast with him. Tom Rascon, wonderful guy, wonderful guy, hell of a soldier, too. But anyway, we get in the Jeep and off we go uh, to headquarters, and, and when I got there, I gave orders to uh, the S-1, he said, um, he said, Cap Spawn, he said, Colonel, been waiting to see you. Okay, so I walked in, boarded, gave him copy of orders. He says, I got your folder here. Folder meeting here, I got your file. Mm -hmm. He says, very impressive, very impressive. He says, uh, I'm going to be keeping you pretty busy. In other words, I'm going to be running off the island all the time. Mm -hmm. And we had a nice little conversation, about 10 minutes. And he says, anything? He says, by the way, he says, the officers call Friday, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, sir, that might be a very good time for this. Oh my God, he says, the Army, once again, has committed a boo-boo. He said, they're promoting Rashkana. I said, <laughs> I said, he's on the same orders as me. I said, he was my OCS buddy in range manner, my OCS. Mm -hmm. He says, oh my God. He says, well, I said, we'll make some hay with this. So, officers call Friday night, uh, wives and everybody was there. And uh, after a little socializing and all, the uh, Colonel called, you know, 
made a little speech about there had to be some changes made and there are certain things that would not be tolerated any longer and he just you know, and the adjutant knew and I knew and I don't think anybody else did but anyway he called Tom Rascon up. Now Tom has always been a little bit of problems with his weight mm -hmm. and uh, the colonel you know kind of was doing this and that with him and all that and he says actually he says uh, Lieutenant Rascon he says you're just not the caliber of lieutenants that I want in my organization. And he reached out to Lieutenant Barzal, and I thought Tom was going to die. He was just, he watered up, and, you know, because he was a life, I mean, career mm -hmm. man. He was, he was in there for life, but he took his uh, bars off him, and he turned around the adjutant, and the adjutant had him the captain bars. He says, I think these would work a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> When he put the cat mark and Rascal looked at me, he said, he looked right dead at me, you know, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Just, you know, I'll get even with you one of these days. But anyway, uh, Tom was married, really nice gal, and uh, she got sick. I think she passed away about four years after that, five years, I'm not really sure. But uh, he now, he's in a wheelchair in uh, uh, Blue Ridge. Virginia, near Roanoke, mm -hmm. somewhere down a little small town. But a uh, wonderful guy, hell of a soldier. So on Okinawa, I'm running back and forth on Operation Snakebite back and forth to Vietnam. Uh, some of the guys I operated with were Bob Howard, Medal of Honor, Fred Zabotowski, Medal of Honor. Great soldiers, just great guys. and. Uh, finished up there. Well, what kind of work were you doing? So you're going back and forth. Are you just taking um, orders or? No, we're going into Vietnam, mm -hmm. Laos, back and forth, right. across the border. See, they had a thing in, in Da Nang, CCN, Command Control North. They, they would leave Da Nang and go in on a mission. Mm -hmm. They'd be in less than an hour or they, they would get hit when they landed. Mm -hmm. So everybody knew where they were coming. So they had a spy somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they called, they come to uh, Okinawa and explain the situation. They asked for volunteers, so naturally we all step forward. And in those type of situations, majority of times, not always, but the majority of times it was always the single guys that would get the mission. Mm -hmm. And so I was running back and forth. And uh, we would go in. But when we go into Da Nang, you know, C-130, hop over, you get the last minute little briefing thing of mm -hmm. any latest intel going for that area, and hop in a chopper, and boom, we'd be in right at crack of dawn, we'd be in, chopper would be out. And uh, of course the chopper would make half a dozen stops, mm -hmm. you know, trying to confuse whoever. We would get in, complete the mission, call for pickup, and be out. But several times, and finally, what, the way they knew they had a, a, a spy in there was we were sitting right here and we're looking right down the highway here, coming up this way. And we radioed in, you know, you know such and such ready for extraction, great coordinate such and such. And we sat back and waited, sat there waiting. Less than an hour, here comes trucks. So there had to be a spy mm -hmm. sitting there in that same headquarters. And they kept narrowing it down, narrowing it down as to which section, which group. Mm -hmm. And finally they nailed it down to who. And that's where I think um, when Colonel Rowe got replaced, sent home, relieved, uh, about the double agent thing, where they took him out in the chopper out in the South China Sea and dropped him. Yeah, they, they found him. Mm -hmm. they, so we, now was the, basically the work that you were doing was all going to gear toward finding who the spy was, or did you have no, no, other no, kinds no, of no, missions? No, we were still running missions. Okay, and the missions are those basically reconnaissance, just trying to find out who was where and what they're right. doing. Reconnaissance okay. mission. Now, one one of the biggest thing and most stu stupidest yeah. stupidest thing I ever seen was uh, VMAG, uh, General Westmoreland. It wasn't Westmoreland then, though. It was somebody else, four stars sitting down there. Uh, his staff 
said that uh, we we went in, you know, and drew it on the map. There's a highway down there mm -hmm. underneath the trees. This is where it goes. And the guy says, it's impossible. There's no way. There's no way the road out there. Blah blah blah. So we went back in on another basin somewhere else. But we went, came back the long way and went down there and stood there in the middle of the road, took pictures. And you know, by us standing on the road, they could see how big the road was. You know, taking pictures. And we, you know, this is facing north. This is facing south. This is a road that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And we drew the line again on the map. And we went this time, we went right down that thing taking pictures and exiting the map where those pictures were taken. Came back, put an envelope, made sure that the Intel people got it, and sent it to the general, the colonel, whoever mm -hmm. it was, that said the road wasn't there. And uh, I never heard another word about it. However, we also marked on there where the locations were that could be used for uh, truck parks. Mm -hmm. I mean, the area was cleared out of mud. It had to be for something. Okay, so they put them in there. And then later on is when, boom, bombs. So we're talking about what came to be known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Or well, some that part was of part it? of the trail, yeah. 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 Uh, but see, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was, uh, was a trail, was a road, was mm -hmm. a lot of different yeah. things. It was just an egress from north to south right. to get them in. Right. And uh, this is an extended version of mm -hmm. it now. What made it interesting was the Cubans is what built that road, Cuban engineers. Mm -hmm. Because they had equipment sitting there, you know, picture. Spanish. I don't know if NBA speaks Spanish. Mm -hmm. So we put that in there. Oh God, let's see. I left there. We got back to uh, uh, Okinawa. And uh, myself and Bill Walsh, we were, you know, you got to get back to the States. I thought, you know, I thought what we do? So anyway, we cleared. Okay, and got the planes and flew back and reported into Fort Benning, Georgia. What it was, was we were reporting into Fort Benning, Georgia to attend, to attend the Vietnamese orientation course. Somebody had looked on our records and said, well, you have to attend the Vietnamese orientation course. And they said, what is it? And they tell you, it says, well, it teaches you all about Vietnam, how to be there, and what to expect. I'm thinking we're a little bit late for that. But what really was funny about it, here's the first lieutenant sitting there as the company commander of this thing. He was on one of our teams, got wounded and sent back. Mm -hmm. And here he is then. He looked at us, what are you guys doing here? So we need we need to learn about Vietnam. <laughs> and he says, Yeah, he's very says, Here's the date you graduate. He says, be back the day before. I said, see you around, Lieutenant. We left. I went back to Bragg, see my old, old buddies. Now, yeah. how, how dangerous was the duty that you were doing going in and out of Vietnam with Special Forces? Well, people getting killed, mm -hmm. people getting captured. And how close, did you have close calls yourself? Or oh, yeah. You? yeah. Go to the territory. Okay. But uh, anyway, I got back to Bragg, horsed around for three or four weeks, went back to Benning, gave, they gave us our certificates, mm -hmm. completed the course. And, and uh, then by that time, I'm going back to Bragg. They have no new orders cut, so I'm going back to Bragg, uh, JFK Center, Space Warfare Center. And I'm there for, oh gosh, eight, nine months. And all of a sudden, I get orders that I'm going to go to infantry office. No, that was the other time. I get orders from uh, Pentagon saying that I'm going to Vietnam. I said, I just got back. Mm -hmm. So I called Mrs. Alexander. Now, Mrs. Alexander has to be a saint. I've never met the lady personally, but I talked to her on the phone. And I said, Mrs. Alexander, what are you doing to me? She says, now, Fred, she says, you need to get a regular unit. I says, I was in Vietnam in 62, 63. She says, honey, she was using list of men then. That didn't count. I said, didn't count. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, well, I just came back. I was with the first going in and out. She said, no, that's special forces. That didn't count. I said, that didn't count. It was 
it was getting so comical with the didn't count routine, you know. I said, okay. She says, you have, in order to, for your career, she says, you need to get company command time. I said, yeah, I said, you're right. I said, okay, I said, you know, cut the orders, I'll go. Now, who was Mrs. Alexander? She handled officer assignments in the mm -hmm. Pentagon. Okay. Lovely lady. I'd love to meet her someday. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, went over and uh, went in to see General Flanagan. And I said, sir, I can't go on that mission that you wanted me to go on. I said, because I got my orders to you know, Vietnam. He picked him up and looked. He said, Big Red One? I said, that's what it says. He said, no, he said, you're not going to Big Red One. And he twixed somebody, I don't know. So when I got to Vietnam, uh, two, three weeks later, I had a little guy stand out there with my name on a card. And went over, we hopped in the Jeep and drove down at the end of the uh, runway. And there was this chopper and he woke the guys up and we got in the chopper and took off. I think, well, oh, this army's all right. And this is okay for a captain to say, mm -hmm. this isn't too bad. So we get down there, and uh, I knew where the 1st Division was, but we're still going. Mm -hmm. We stopped down, refuel, pick up, and go again. And I thought, where in the hell are we going? You know, the next stop up, there's not too many more. So we bank in, and when he banked in, I looked out, and there was a big screaming eagle sitting out there. So down we go, sat in another Jeep, brought me over to the headquarters. Mm, excuse me. And uh, we go in there, and the G1 uh, says, uh, Oh, Captain Spice, says, uh, Chief of Staff wants to see you. Told you to report to him when you got in. I said, Okay. So I walked in, and I you know, went in. Sir, so Captain Spice reported, he looked up, and bingo. Chief of Staff of the 101st Airborne Division was Colonel Huey McDonald, was the guy that kicked me in the butt back at Bragg to make me go to OCS. Mm -hmm. Here he was. He was an old friend with Flanagan, General mm -hmm. Flanagan. So anyway, he says, I've been expressing you spoken about it. So anyway, we uh, we got a sign. He says, You're going to go down to the 1st Brigade. I said, Okay. He says, 327. I said, All right. He said, yeah, he says, they got some problems down there. Just, uh, you know, we had to beef them up with the company commanders that's coming in. I said, okay. Now, when was this in terms of date? It was 69. Yeah, early part of 69. Okay. And uh, anyway, uh, went in there and uh, got a, a little bit of a briefing of what's going on you know, from the G3 shop in the AO and then uh, hopped in a helicopter and went down to first brigade and walked in. There were three or four officers that was going in. We we're all about the same time, so I, I went in. I was last to get into the little group there. One I went in and we had the door open and we could hear and uh, he was reporting to the battalion commander. He said, sir, sir I, my major was English. I could be a great S1 for you. Next guy went in, he says, uh, Sir, he says, I, I did a lot, uh, you know, stock uh, level assignments. I could be a great S-4 for you. And I'm thinking, we're all infantry. Why aren't we going to the field and lead the troops? What's, you know? So the next guy, he, he did his, I don't know what he got out of, or some motor pool or something. Mm -hmm. And I walked in, and, you, know, you know, sir, Captain Frederick comes for the reporting, the best company commander in Vietnam, give me the worst company you got. He just looked at me, just, you know, like manna from heaven. My mm -hmm. God, finally we got it. <laughs> and uh, he did give me the worst company. He gave me the worst company. But I was had them about four months, uh, four or five months, had them straightened out. We were really kicking some butt out there. And Can you then, describe a little bit what, what made a company the worst company in the unit? Or what kind of problems well, did they have? Discipline. Lack of uh, NCO leadership. A lot of the NCOs was afraid, and some of the platoon leaders was afraid to um, bring any discipline on the troops, or give them orders, or demand mm -hmm. things be done uh, because of all the fragging incidents that was going on at that time. How common was that? I mean, what here's very common. Okay. From what I heard, it didn't happen to mine. Mm -hmm. 
go anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got uh, two, three weeks of training of myself. I had them on the rifle range. I had them running this way, that way, outside the wire uh, patrols and this and that. And when they started finding that uh, I was sitting right over the top of the guy that was walking point, mm -hmm. you know, a couple times I took the point. And I said, you're doing it wrong. You're going to get killed. This is the way you do it. And mm -hmm. Then they found out that I was nine years enlisted. Mm -hmm. I did just get off the boat with a couple of captain bars on. It made it a little bit different. So the troops started responding. Then we went out and started kicking some butt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found out the guys before me, they would be like on the last chopper or the next to last chopper in. Well, I was always on the first chopper in. And the best ally, the best asset that a company commander has is his radio operator. Mm -hmm. Because his radio operator is right there with him, and he sees everything the captain does. He hears everything the captain does, and he is the best grapevine back to the troops. Mm -hmm. He's going to tell everybody what the captain's doing, and uh, that's how you win them over. So in a firefight or something, you don't be running around hiding behind trees and shit. You're up there kicking the butt, you know, getting them to do their job. Now, did you have a good RTO then? No, I had a great RTO. When you want to get something done, like in, in a, you know, going on in a firefight. Uh, Our tape here is about done, so I'm going to. Okay, so we, we've gotten you back into Vietnam. You've right. gotten yourself a company command, and right. you've taken over a company, uh, and gotten that one into shape after several months. Uh, and then what happens with you next? Well, uh, what, well, ordinarily you had six months of command time. Mm -hmm. On that instance there, my main purpose was to go in, according to the battalion commander, wanted me to go in and get the company shaped up, get them out of their doldrums, mm -hmm. whatever it was, and which I did that. And uh, after four months, he pulled me out of that and gave me another company to straighten it, you know, work on. Had them for three or four months. And then the second battalion, it was first battalion, the second battalion uh, was having problems. So the uh, battalion commander requested I go over there, which I did go mm -hmm. over there, and I had Alpha. Company, I think it was Alpha Company, Second Three Two Seven, and uh, they had uh, at that time they had no body count whatsoever. But yet the village that they was and the bridge that they were supposed to be protected, there was rice being taken out of the village, people being killed in the village, mm -hmm. just all kind of stuff. So uh, went out, set that up, and put start putting patrols out. LPOPs, mm -hmm. uh, listing post, uh, right. observation post, and uh, uh, requested a mortar section come down by the bridge and put them in, and that way I got my own little artillery now. If I get somebody out there to get some contact, I'll just pop them with the mortar, the mortar rounds. And we started doing that, and we started getting body counts. And uh, we took on the, what they called the Fulak Armed Battalion which was nothing more than about a hundred uh, little jokers running around in shorts and slippers. And uh, we took care of them, no short order, no problem. Had that company for, oh gosh, about six, seven months. And now where were you operating? Was this kind of the lowland area? This was on the lowlands. This was all, all low, flat, yeah. And, uh, Right off the highway, we protected the highway and right. the highway bridge and the railroad bridge. And uh, so anyway, got pulled out of that. Thanks for a great job, blah blah blah. And then I got sent up to Division G3 and the staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, my God, me and I don't know how many other captains. It looked like a warehouse with just row after row of desks and no protection, just wide open. Mm -hmm. There it was. I got there, I might forget what day it was, but it was in the afternoon. Uh, the next morning, Colonel McDonald came in, Chief of Staff, and said, I need some company grade uh, officers. Third Brigade just got hit last night and we just about got annihilated. And I said, I'll go. He says, no, you've been out there too much already. So 
with these other guys, and it really, in a way, it was very disheartening because we're officers, mm -hmm. we're career oriented. And these guys, every time Colonel Mack came walking down, they go, oh, sir, I've got these reports. I just got to get these done for Colonel so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And the other guy, oh, sir, are these that. And every time Colonel Mack would turn around, I wouldn't say anything. I just kind of waved him like, you know. So yeah, he was so disgusted. He got walking up, and he turned around. He says, uh, Spalding says, grab your gear. He says, you don't deserve to be in here with them. So I left, grabbed my gear reported over, had a chopper waiting, and went down to 3rd Brigade. 3rd Brigade was the farthest brigade north, mm -hmm. uh, up there. It was up in Quang Tree Way, Dong Holly, had the mm -hmm. whole high core area. And um, what used to be a three division AO was now a one brigade AO, one battalion per division area, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. pretty bad. But anyway, uh, went up there. Bravo Company and I think it was Charlie Company, I'm not sure, was in contact and they were two, three hundred, four hundred yards apart somewhere in here. Of, okay. of which battalion or? Uh, 2506. Okay. Okay, so I went in and uh, married them up, got them squared away, had artillery all around them all night long and sort of much like babysit with them where uh, the choppers come in the next day with reinforcements, and we got all these guys on choppers on the road and did dead and all that. We got them on choppers, got them out of there. And then uh, I'm thinking this would be my company. So we get over to Curry Pad, and the first sergeant says, uh, Sir, we're sending the chopper for you. Colonel Bradley, the brigade commander, wants to see you. So I went over to brigade, uh, got on chopper, went back to brigade, and that's where I left my bags and stuff. And I walked in, and Colonel, or Major Turner, and he says, uh, Captain Spalding, Colonel Bradley, blah, blah, blah. So we went in there, and uh, Turner says, Come, Sir, this is Captain Spalding. And he turned around and says, Great job. He's a great job. I said, Well, sir, I says, uh, and we can talk for a little bit. I said, Well, there's nothing else, sir. I'd like to get back to my company. He says, No. He says, You're going to be on my staff. And I'm not a, excuse me, I'm not a staff officer. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I told him, I said, well, sir, I'd rather have the company. And uh, he says, well, he says, I realize that, but says, up here at Brigade, if you're working in my three shop, he says, you're going to have 15, 16 companies out there. I thought, hmm, that's a pretty good argument there. He says, at Brigade level, you can make the changes. You can make things happen. Mm -hmm. And I explained to him I had no staff time. I had you know, no staff experience whatsoever. He said, well, this is a good place to work. Now, Colonel Bradley was uh, at West Point in 1950, straight into the Korean War. A uh, hell of a man, really a great guy. And uh, anyway, uh, he had him on his staff. I was the assistant S3 was under Major Turner. Everything was going great. We're losing guys rotation-wise. They're going home, mm -hmm. and as they're leaving, we're not getting any replacements. So I'm taking up their slots too. Uh, Sonny Archangel, Captain Archangel, uh, was the S3, and he got his orders and he went home. So I took over as the S3, and I'm assistant, still the assistant S3. Then I'm giving briefings at night, the briefing mm -hmm. officer. Then I'm taking care of the talk making sure it's running right, and then fire support, because if I'm moving aircraft, i got to coordinate all the artillery, because uh, helicopter pilots get just a little bit upset when a 105 round goes in mm -hmm. front of them. So we had to get all that done. But it was a great experience for me, and I didn't realize it at first. But as we got to functioning, uh, man, this is fantastic. This is the way to operate. Now, at what point did you uh, go on to brigade staff in terms of time? When was it? <sighs> that was February, uh, right around St. Valentine's Day. 1970 then? In 1970. Right. Uh, because the big uh, firefight where they lost so many uh, uh, officers, uh, and that was a fluke the way that happened. Evidently, a couple of rockets came in and they were all standing, you know, won't. 
But anyway, I was right around uh, St. Valentine's Day, which somebody labeled it, you know, St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. But uh, right after that, uh, we had several contacts, and that's when the orders come down, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to open up a fire base, we're going to open that fire base up so the First R Division can come out and take on the NVA and the Cockmune mm -hmm. warehouse mm -hmm. area. And uh, so we went in on March the 12th and blew the first one. The helicopter come in, flared, and blew the first one right out of the sky. Uh, George Westerfeld was on that aircraft and blew him right out on the side. Uh, there were several other guys was on there. A couple of them got killed. Uh, George got wounded. Now, George Westerfeld, you know, you'll probably never be able to talk to him. He's a recluse, was up in northern New York in a little shack. No electricity, no running water. He walks about a mile and a half, two miles down to the general store at the highway. That's where he gets his mail, and that's where you've got to call the general store and it'll leave a message and he'll get back to you in two or three days. But anyway, uh, wonderful guy though, hell of a soldier, great man. But uh, we couldn't get on there on the 12th, we couldn't get on the 13th or the 14th, so we kind of pulled back a little bit and then we was looking around. We kept trying every now and then, but also we it's a lot of times we got out there and the weather was socked in. Mm -hmm. Couldn't get the choppers in, Lynn, all that. It's still monsoon in the mountains? Right, right, in and out, yeah. Uh, and, and the weather changed so bad all the time. But finally, we put troops in over here and on the ridge line of 902, and we walked them right up the ridge line right into it. Um, I think no, it's. Uh, stop here. They were supposed to come through this morning. Now you were talking about trying to. Now, was, was the LZ you were trying to, to set up, uh, was that going to be ripcord or is this a different one? No, it wasn't an LZ, it was a fire base. Yeah, yeah, we landed over here, landed yeah. over here, and we walked the troops right. up okay. onto the fire base. All right. And we took it that way. Once we got the troops up there, mm -hmm. secure the area, then what we do, we brought in the mini dozers and all that, started leveling, flattening, whatever. Uh, sandbags by the thousands, hundreds of thousands came in, PSP, bunkers, you know, brought the engineers in and started drilling. We got the fire base up and brought the artillery in. And then here, okay, here comes the first arm division. They came out. They were out there three, four, five days a week, right around that. They pull out and go back, and we're still sitting out there. So then we decide, okay, we'll just stay here. That's our orders, so we we'll stay. Now, in order to hold Ripcord, we pretty much had to hold 1,000, 805, 902. Mm -hmm. But we never did get 1,000. And they were looking right down our throats. We found out later that was regimental headquarters. Right. Now, what was the elevation of Ripcord? 935. The, okay. So 1,000, that's that's a taller hill, and there's taller ones behind that, too. Because yeah. you've got right Cockman down, and... Looking yeah. right down your throat. Uh, in 51 Cal, they could fire right at you, direct fire. And that's how close it was. Mm -hmm. And machine gun fire. They, they could fire at it. But anyway, um, that's when the battle started in April, May, June, July. Now, all through April, we had sporadic contact. And what I mean by sporadic is like every two days, three days, something like that. May is when all hell broke loose. Okay. May 3rd and 4th was Henderson, Firebase Henderson was overrun. Um, Hill 805 on May 5th and 6th was overrun. Hill 902 was June. Uh, we lost a lot of guys on that. But uh, Henderson, we put a company on there. It gave them all the wire, gave them claymores, gave them everything else. And Colonel Bradley and Major Turner have been out there, I don't know how many times, telling this company commander, you know, put a squad on that ridge, get your wire up, put the claymores up, get an OP over there. Get an LP out over there, and when the artillery comes in, help the artillery people break up the pallets and get the out and get the artillery ammunition stored. Well, the company commander figured that number one, he was infantry wasn't artillery, the artillery rounds wasn't his problem. So when the Chinooks start breaking in and putting all the pallets down, okay, the artillery, then they're bringing in the uh, 
gasoline blivets. Mm -hmm. No place to put them, and they put them right on top of the artillery ammunition pallets. Now, we gave this guy uh, the recon platoon attached to him, which they're on the backside in the trenches. Mm -hmm. Good place for recon in a trench. That's really great. But anyway, um, the enemy come through, the sappers come running through, and they uh, split the gasoline blivets. And then throughout the fighting and all that, and then they boom, ignited that sucker, and the whole half of the mountain blew, boom. There went the recon platoon. Uh, during the run through, they were shooting everybody, and most of the troops wasn't fighting back or something. I don't really know. I wasn't on it mm -hmm. at that time. But I do know we lost a hell of a lot of troops on that hill. Uh, Colonel Bradley went out there and very Excuse me, next very next morning, him and Turner and Command Sergeant Major Long. They landed about 7.15, and the mortar rounds are still coming in. They're running up to the top, and the mortar round landed right behind him, blew him right through the door. Sergeant Major Long took a tail fin of a mortar round in his back. He later died. Bradley and Turner was scuffed up from going through the doorway of the uh, chalk. They grabbed uh, Sergeant Major Long, called for his chopper, and uh, chopper came, just spun right back around, came right back in, and running out, put him on him, and off they went. Uh, Sergeant Major Long died in route to 80 at the back. Bradley and Turner come back into the top, blood all over, and just matters hornets, and he said, you know, get that individual in here. So I said, I'll go get him. And Captain Jenkins says, I'll go with you. Captain Jenkins was a huge uh, black guy, played for the University of Alabama, right tackle, right guard, somebody, somebody. I mean, he mm -hmm. was big. So we get out there, we took a loach, a little boy, 6A helicopter, we were flying out there. And we landed, and I went over to the talk, and uh, I told the RTO, I said, get your kind of commander out here. And uh, he hollered back in, and I didn't hear what was said, but anyway, the, the kid turned around and says, he ain't coming out, sir. And I said, okay. Well, I started to go in, Jenkins says, wait a minute, I'll take this. Jenkins went in, and it wasn't 30 seconds, that guy come flying out there. Jenkins was pretty upset, and everybody, I think, was that knew Sergeant Major Long. Mm -hmm. Tremendous individual, just a tremendous individual. And for this guy not to have the troops out like he was told to do, mm -hmm. have the wire up like he was told, that would have slowed him down anyway. Yeah. So that way they had a time to react. And then not moving the artillery ammunition, which killed, I don't know, the 30, 40, mm -hmm. when that blew. But anyway, uh, when we started to get back in the helicopter, the loach, Jenkins, as big as he was, that captain, me, and the pilot, that plane, there's no way in hell that helicopter's going to go anywhere. Uh, and the RTO, and I told him, I says, contact one of your lieutenants and tell them they're now in charge. And he told, looked right dead at me, he says, sir, we got no officers left. I thought, oops, we ain't going to have it. I said, Jenkins, I said, you run him on back. Tell Colonel Bradley, I'm, I'll stay out here. So I went over and started talking to the kid. I says, where's all you under? Where's this? Where's that? I says, where's your, well, we'll get the medic. Where's the medic at? And the medic come up, and he'd been wounded, but he didn't leave. So he, the medic and I went around Firebase, uh, Henderson, picking up the dead, picking up the wounded. And I could not believe that the company commander had not already evacuated you guys. Mm -hmm. There were still wounded there that hadn't yeah. been taken out? Yeah. All right. So anyway, we and the medic had passed him up. He just didn't call for medevac. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we brought him up to the pad, called for medevac, got these guys out of there, uh, brought the dead up and lined them up. And uh, God, there was 20, 30 of them, I forget now. But uh, I took pictures of it because I figured there's going to be an investigation mm -hmm. about this later on. But anyway, uh, I was talking with the medic, and he explained to me what all transpired and all that. So I'm calling back to a brigade, and I, you know, I said, we need to get another uh, company out here. Because 
I didn't want to send it in the clear, but they didn't have anybody to hold the hill. Mm -hmm. the art, all the artillery pieces was blown, mm -hmm. blown up. Anyway, we're still taking fire. But how many men do you have left who can still fight? Thirty, okay. somewhere around that. But anyway, um, the way it came around was that we're still taking fire, direct fire, mm -hmm. which means they're pretty close, and indirect fire, more direct. But I got on the radio, took one of the radios, changed the frequency. Me being the S3 Air, I knew what the frequency was for the FAC, mm -hmm. Air Force FAC, and I called him up, Major Brown. And uh, tell him, I said, Skipper, I said, I need a fact out here. He says, on the way. And I bang, he pretty soon he circled around mm -hmm. up there. I says, I'm taking mortar fire. I says, because when, when we hit a mortar round, I'd run out and shoot a back azimuth on mm -hmm. it. And I says, it's got to be right down across that ridge out there, about the third one down. I said, you see, the, there's three trees on that ridge line. And while I'm talking to the fact, to the dumbest thing in the world, I see flashes off of this there. And what it was, it had to be the NVA guy with his binoculars up and the sun's behind me, the sun's reflecting off those binoculars. It had to be. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, yeah, I said, I see the flashing. He said, let me go see what I can find. So he went out there and he had a couple of A6s on station. He flew in, fired a couple of rockets, pulled out. Whoa, there they went. And we got, I don't know how many secondary explosions off of that. I mean, it was just. So we took care of that. But, um, yeah, well, then we had, I had to go to Mylock to send a ch chopper from me. I went out to Mylock. We had the 2501 coming in. We're going to put them in the AO. Mm -hmm. So I explained what was going on with the fire base and the AO. And we went back and then we put them back in. We had to put the companies down to the stream bed, we put one company on the hill, and I walked that company around the fire, the perimeter, and when we got to the, where the troops were, I had the troops go right back, down the same way to the helicopter bed, get back on the choppers and get out of there. Mm -hmm. So we got the new company in, Colonel Livingston was a battalion commander, he brought in staff, and he says, uh, you know, Captain Spalding, I said, sir, he says, you going to stay with us? I said, sure, I don't care. He says, fine. I said, you got to notify the brigade, though, and let them know I'm here. All right. So about 10 minutes later, he, I was standing there with the company commander explaining to him. I said, you need to get a squad on that ridge over there. That's where they came from. Mm -hmm. I said, you need a squad on this ridge down here. I said, that's where the other side came from. I said, as far as the, that little club back out there, I said, you need to put some claymores in there. So anyway, he and I was discussing all this, and he was getting his sergeants out to take mm -hmm. care of it. Mm -hmm. Here come Colonel uh, Livingston, man as a hornet. He says, your chopper's on the way. He says, Colonel Bradley wants you back at brigade. So I got back to brigade, and uh, you know, Colonel Bradley said, well, good job, Fred. But I said, well, sir, I says, Colonel Livingston needed me out there, too. He says, no, I says, I need you here. I never did understand what that was about. I don't know if it was a little argument between them two or not. I don't know. I don't really care. May, um, you know, that was May 3rd, 4th. May 5th, 6th was uh, uh, 805, Hill 805, and we put uh, Delta 1506 on there. And we had, uh, gosh, I forget how many casualties we had, but I know we had 17 left, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the night. But, or at the end of the battle, three days, three day battle. And then June, Hill 902, and we had a company in there. Uh, we had third platoon of Charlie Company 2506 on that hill, mm -hmm. and uh, now we had the company on there minus one platoon. The other had, platoon. Were you A company or C company? Charlie Company. Oh, okay. We had yeah. Charlie Company 2506 right. on the hill, and one platoon, which I don't know what platoon it was. Berkey's, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Berkey's mm -hmm. platoon, Sergeant, he was platoon sergeant, and Jim Campbell, they were up on Ripcord. Mm -hmm. And uh, Doc Cafferty was a medic. But we had, uh, uh, anyway, we had uh, several different people on it, and uh, we put them in around the thing, and gave them orders, gave the company commander his orders and all that, and he pretty much ignored it. 
and he paid for it. He got killed. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mike Mueller was down on the end, and we told him, you know, you know, you're the you're the flank, you're the end. Don't let them pass you. And, okay. Now Mike was from Alaska, hell of a shot, and he stuttered when he got excited. But uh, that night, she hit the fan. I mean, it was pretty bad. I'm out in the chopper, infrared. I'm calling in airstrikes all over the place. I'm calling in artillery all over the place, trying to keep them off of them. But uh, they were already on. But anyway, next morning, he hit there. We brought in uh, more troops uh, next morning and went up on the hill and went running up and down the line. You know, where's everybody at? Who's with us? What's mm -hmm. happened? Everything. Here's Mike Miller sitting down on the end. He's got holes in him all over the place. And I don't know how many bodies he's got out around him. Uh, there was a bunch, 11, 12, 15, I don't know. There was a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. He only had a maybe like four or five rounds left. And like I say, he was hit up legs, back. He was hit everywhere. And he was, you know, staring. And I come running up there and he said, Sir, sir, I, I, I didn't let them through, and I thought, Jesus Christ, where do we find guys like this, you know? So I said, okay, Mike, I said, but uh, you did a great job, we're getting you out of here. By this time, we already had guys all over the place mm -hmm. grabbing them, running. But uh, we got him out. Mike today is uh, living in Alaska. He's been in a wheelchair for about the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. But hell of a guy, hell of a guy. But uh, Doc Cafferty, a uh, wonderful guy. It was just so much for him. He was dragging wounded up to the CP. The lieutenant, or the captain, got blown in half with mm -hmm. an RPG right next to him, scattered him with everything. But Cafferty was dragging the wounded up to the CP as best he could, and then with a pistol standing there, keeping the NBA off of him. He got a silver star. Mike got a silver star, you know, and uh, we had one guy, um, gosh, years go by, you forget the name, mm -hmm. you can still see the faces, but uh, anyway, he was Smoker, Bob Smoker. He is now a minister, has been for many years. It was such a traumatic thing to him that when he got out, he went to the ministry. That's the only way he could save himself, I guess. Wonderful man. Uh, Doc Cafferty went to work for the post office. Uh, became somewhat of an alcoholic. Uh, he's dried out now. But uh, hell of a man. Mm -hmm. Hell of a man. But then, that was June. Uh, in July, that was June. Then we had July started one to 23 was mm -hmm. considered the siege. Now, right. in between these major encounters, every day or every other day, we had people in contact regardless mm -hmm. of where we was at, out there. We, at one time, we not only had the 3rd uh, third Battalion, the 187th, 2nd Battalion, 506, the 1506, mm -hmm. uh, we had OPCON to us, the 1501, 2501, 1502, 2502. There's only nine battalions in a division. We had seven. Now those are not all operating immediately on or right next to Ripcord. Parts of several different battalions are there along with 2506, but not all at the same we time. We got them in the area. Right. They are all right. under 3rd Brigade. Right. They are all there in support of what we're trying to do to take care of Ripcord. we got to protect Ripcord. As well, and you've got a string of other fire bases around that that yes. are providing support fire. Granite, are, yeah. Gladi yeah. Granite Gladiator, O'Reilly, Castle. Mm -hmm. Those are the main ones. And we've opened up Shepherd up north. Mm -hmm. All right. And this is when we were explaining to Division that, hey, we got more than a damn division out there. Yeah. And of course, it reminded me so much of MacArthur and China. Mm -hmm. No, there are no more. That's what we're getting from division. No, yeah. there's only one one division out there, one NBA mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, can't be. So 
what we found out later, years later, was we had four divisions out there against us. And a 324B whose main the main function in life was to destroy Ripcord and everybody on it. Mm -hmm. That was their main function. The 805, I believe it was, 325, and then we had a 6th Independent Regiment with that nine battalions, which I had never heard of mm -hmm. nine battalions in a regiment. But uh, it was all like Ranger battalions, Sapper battalions, and stuff like that. Now, what kind of strength levels did you have in your own battalions at this point? You have supposed to have 176 men in a rifle company, four rifle companies per battalion. Mm -hmm. Out of the 176 men, if you had 60 men in your rifle company, you was big. Mm -hmm. Majority of them had anywhere between 30 to 40. Mm -hmm. uh, Ripcord, some of them were getting down to 15 or something like that. 15, 16, and 17. What we wound up with, mm -hmm. yeah. If you had 15 men, hell, you know. But uh, General Barry could not understand why we can't take Alpha and Bravo Company and take that hill. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, Alpha and Bravo Company combined won't even make one platoon. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in my estimation. The worst officer we could have ever had in charge of that operation was General Barry. To me, he is a complete idiot. But in, in the Keith Nolan book about Ripcord, he presents him as somebody who eventually comes to recognize that he doesn't have the strength to do what he wants to do. He's initially giving the orders that, yeah, we've got to keep going and moving the units like little marks on a map, and then getting down and seeing it and changing his mind. Um, how close is that to how you perceive things? Well, it, what happened was General Barry was here for, for the briefing. General Barry and had all the officers from the brigade, General, uh, Colonel Harrison. Mm -hmm. But I go through the briefing, blah, 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 blah. This is this, this is this, that's it. And uh, General Barry, uh, he was a very, I don't know, guy, theatrical, stood up, oh, that is key terrain. We must have that key terrain. And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, somebody must be filming this, otherwise he wouldn't be doing this. And Colonel Lucas, Lieutenant Colonel Lucas, jumps up like a little jack-in-the-box. Oh, sir, cur he, my men can take that hill, sir. And I'm thinking, Jesus, is these guys can't see? And I says, well, excuse me. I said, but now these are the numbers that I got from your S-1. Right here. You don't have enough men to take that hill, sir. And uh, anyway, they decided the next morning they were going to take the hill. Now, where does Colonel Harrison come into the picture? Because you haven't really introduced him yet in your account. But Colonel Harrison came in in 20 June. Okay, Colonel Bradley went home 20 June. Colonel Harrison took over 20 June. We had a change of command ceremony. Mm -hmm. Colonel Bradley walked off this way to get on that helicopter to go that way to division headquarters, clear, and go home. Colonel Harrison got on, went this way, got on his helicopter, and went that way out to the Asha Valley. It was just, you know, hello, boom, bang, boom, that was it. Uh, his first day on the job, uh, he didn't come in that evening till late because uh, he was out there. And, uh, you know, not only assessing the situation, but we have, well, we was, doing the change of command ceremony and the, the flag went around faster than ever you could ever see. We had people in contact. We had three or four elements in contact. Every day we had two, three, four elements in contact. Uh, and nobody else in Vietnam was having any contact. We mm -hmm. was having it all up here. Mm -hmm. But what it was, once you start assessing it and analyzing it, we figured it out years later what the thing was. We were sitting right on the main route for their planned attack to take Saigon. And years later, 75, that's exactly the way they came, mm -hmm. right through there and right down the highway. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting on their route of advance, and they had to move us. Mm -hmm. And we weren't about to be moved. So on the 22nd of July, after the briefing, um, the, you know, we, we closed it up, you know, any questions, blah, blah, blah. 
And at that time, see, we requested five more battalions. And we can go in there and really kick some butt. Mm -hmm. And General Barry said, no, uh, you're not getting your five battalions. And Colonel Harrison said, well, he says, that's it then. He says, we'll pull them out. He says, I'm not going to sacrifice any more of my men. So he said, that's it, Fred, take them out. Yes, sir. And I'm heading out the door to put it all into, you know, put it all into play. And uh, General Barry stops me and he says, you mean to tell me that you're going to put together an operations plan? And he talked very exaggerated. And uh, that's going to withdraw under fire. It was a lot of times that everything I do, not just to bust a gun and laugh at Randy's face. I, I just, I despise the guy. Uh, so pompous, so arrogant. Everything the exact opposite of what to me an officer was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he said, you mean to tell me that you're going to put together an operations plan to withdraw under fire from four different locations, fall under fire? I said, yes, sir. He says, impossible, can't be done. I said, yes, sir. Turn to leave. Colonel Harrison, that's the first time he ever did. He says, Fred, never called me that mm -hmm. before. But I turned around, I said, Yes, sir. He says, He says, Can you do it? I said, Yes, sir, we can do it. We can do it. Because, see, you always have to be planning ahead. Mm -hmm. What if? What mm -hmm. if? So, we already had a plan to take those five battalions, choppers loaded mm -hmm. in, come out empty with all the fire support. When I go empty, come out loaded. Mm -hmm. Same damn thing. I still got all my fire support going. Right. So I cranked up all the aviators, had them down there, and we had a briefing that night. Oh, this is how we're going to do it, guys. Ba, 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 ba. So at 0600 hours the next morning, uh, I'm in my chopper. We're heading west. China, South China Sea's behind us. The sun's coming up. You're looking out there, it's all black. And as the sun's coming up behind you, the top of the mountains, it's lighting up. And it's turning purple. And it's coming down. And it really was pretty. You know, Vietnam could be a really beautiful place if it wasn't shooting everybody. But about this time, and I'm about half asleep, hell, I haven't had any sleep two, three, four days. Hardly anything to eat. The radio, I had four radios down here and two on the stash. And my radio started popping. You know, Alpha 5, 9, or Phoenix 1, 6, rally point over. And I looked south, and just as far as you could see, was a helicopter. On the outside was the little roaches, and then row after row of cobras, gunships, and then inside that was a row of row of ARA cobras. And inside that was two or three rows of Hueys. Now, ordinarily, this is not that great a deal, but with the sun coming up, the sun reflecting off of those plexiglasses looked like a 10,000 flashbulbs going off. Mm -hmm. And by this time, all the radios are going, everybody's checking in. And I said, Roger that, Roger that, Roger that. And I'm looking down there and I'm saying, what an armada. Mm -hmm. What an awesome spectacle. And I'm a part of it. And it made you so damn proud to be a soldier. And that's when I gave him the order. I said, Roger that. You know, vector out. And everybody, choo, choo, choo. everybody started going to which way they're supposed mm -hmm. to be going. We went out there and started kicking butt. Yeah. An entire anti-aircraft battalion of 51 cal machine guns, which is the main purpose designed to mm -hmm. blow an aircraft out right. of the sky, which they did a pretty good job. We had them on every ridge and every hilltop. Mm -hmm. We can't get in until we silence these. Mm -hmm. So here I'm bringing in the ARA, the pink teams, the Cobras, the gunship, blah, 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 blah. Now, when these guys are all through and getting ready to head back to get some fuel, I got me 20-some jets sitting up here. 
They had a KC-135 out of Udorn Thailand, refueled them. Mm -hmm. Well, these guys are going back when they're bringing in the 500-pounders and bringing in the napalm. Mm -hmm. um, we kicked some butt that day. And we got Charlie Company out the day before. We got Delta Company out that morning, first thing before they knew what was going on. By this time, the NVA, they're not dumb. They know with all this mm -hmm. activity, you know, something's going on. Then they figure, oh, my God, they're pulling them out. So we got to annihilate them before we pull them out. Well, we went in to get Char uh, Alpha Company, and the guy, the uh, pilot, sat on the ground, and then he picked up and left it off. And he called me, and he, was, he sounded like he was almost in tears. And he says, we can't get Alpha Company out. I says, what's the problem? He says, they're all hit. They, nobody can get up to get on the chopper. And evidently, when he sat down, it was just laying everywhere. Okay. So he pulls out. So when I go back and I get a hold of uh, Gabe Rollison, Captain Rollison, Delta 2506, one of the finest officers the country's ever produced. He, I told him, I said, we got to go in and get Alpha Company out. I says, I know I just pulled you guys out. I said, but you're all I got. Now, was Alpha Company on Ripcord or one of the other? No, hills? no, no. Alpha Company's over here in the valley. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Bravo's on the hill. Right. So he gets them out, and most of these guys, you know, got bandages all over them, wounded and shit. And he says, Alpha Company's trapped. We said, we got to go back in and get them out. Who wants to go with me? He said, Captain Spaulding and I are going to get them out. Who wants to go with me? And hell, they all started stepping up. Now, Rollison had to tell five or six, no, you're not going. You know, you're already hit too bad. Mm -hmm. But these guys, this, you know, this is your brothers out mm -hmm. there. So anyway, we booked up about 50 guys, 50, 60 guys. And uh, Freddie Gilbert, Staff Sergeant Gilbert, was the point man. Uh, he was going home in two or three weeks. His wife was having a baby. And he was a hell of a guy. But anyway, he was going to be the point man. When they started to put him in, they couldn't get him in on account of the 51 cows. They pulled back out, called me, and I went running back in again, and we blew them all out of there. Put them back in, and uh, Gilbert, Freddie Gilbert, you might want to talk to him. He's on my list. He, uh, <laughs> he says when they went back in, he says, there were just pieces of machine guns and bodies everywhere. He said, we just blew the hell out of them. So he takes off. Now, the enemy is not dumb. When we got troops going this way, they're trying to get in between them, block them from getting mm -hmm. to Alpha County and then annihilate both of them. So I'm dropping grenades and trying to keep them separated. I'm bringing ARA through and we're just having a heck of a time. We link them up. We bring the choppers in, they're picking Alpha Company up, throwing them on the choppers, getting them out of there, and then we get Delta Company out. We got that taken care of, bang, ripcord. Take that care of it. Now, I, I've always thought we got ripcord last. We might have got ripcord first and then mm -hmm. come back over and got these guys. I've always got that backwards that, problem. That, that, that can get looked up in after action reports. Yeah, yeah, I'm not really positive which one we got out first. But anyway, uh, went over to get... Um, Firebase. Now they were already in the wire on the back of the firebase, and we had to blow them off of there. And then we started bringing in the choppers to get the uh, B company out. We got them all out and uh, got them back, and everybody was pretty happy. But then we had arc lights coming in that night. That's one of the reasons why we had to get them all out of there. Now these aircraft have already taken off from Guam, Okinawa. Saipan, the uh, Philippines, wherever. They were already in route. We had to clear the area. And at 38,000 feet, uh, I've been told that a one aircraft dropping 500 pounders, 250 pounds, whatever, one mile wide, three miles long. Okay, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 14, 15 aircraft. Are these the B-52s? B-52s. I mean, they just it was a hell of a spectacle out there. And you, we can get the shock baits back here. But uh, they wrapped that one up. And then after that, everything quieted down. And we went into Barnett area in August. And then, um, see, 
I was assigned down to 3rd Battalion, 187th as the assistant S3. Harrison wanted me to go down there and help them out. And, uh, and I came home January, February of 72. And that was in Space Reports. Mm -hmm. 75 went to Entry Officer Advance Course. Rift in 73, I think it was. And can we hold that for a second? Yeah. <clears throat> Duty calls again. Okay, uh, just to review, let's see, you have your, you go back to the States in 71 or 2 or? Initial? February 71. Okay, yeah. And then and then you're back there. I'm back at Space Forces. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I was there for, oh, gosh, about five months, six months, seven months, somewhere along there. Uh, got my orders for the Infantry Officer Advanced Course, which you had to have that mm -hmm. in order for a career thing. And also, about that time, I got orders for Korea again. There was a buildup on the DMZ, and they're requesting. Uh, company grade officers to Korea, and they were uh, reactivating the first, the 32nd Infantry or something like that out of the 2nd Infantry Division. And uh, I read right speak Korean, so mm -hmm. company grade, combat time, so bingo. You, you had mentioned earlier, you referred to being rift. Uh, does that mean you're reduced in yep, yep. rank? Well, the, that's after. Yeah. Okay. That's after I got to Korea. Okay. Well, you were a major at this time? No. Or captain. Still, still captain? Still captain. Okay. Well, after the war, I mean, I got you, you had some of the longest timing grade captains in mm -hmm. the world. Uh, so, anyway. Um, so, you're going to Korea? Yeah. Well, I'm, I have my I, Infantry Officer Advanced Course in order for Korea, and um, yeah, I asked General Flanagan which way should I go and he said, you should always go to the sound of the guns. The school's not going to change. It'll always be there. He mm -hmm. says, go here and get more combat time. So I went over and I had Charlie Company 1st 32nd Infantry. And we had to literally take the boards off the Quonset huts and then we had to get the place cleaned up and then we, uh, we had three or four buses pull up. And this was my company. They got them out of the stockade. Really nice. Um, and this is back when they had all of these race riots and everything mm -hmm. going on. And about ninety percent of my company was black. Uh, that was a really good mess. But anyway, um, the MP when they got him off the bus, I had to sign for him, and they gave me this big pickaxe handle. He said, "Here, he says you might need this." And I thought, "God, I hope not." So anyway, got them all squared away, got them bedded down, and the best way to get through to troops is to show them that you can do just the same thing they can, if not better. But you're not going to sit behind the desk mm -hmm. and leave from there. So very next morning, I had them out for PT. I gave them PT. I gave them all the calisthenics. I'm mm -hmm. up on the stand and talking about. And they started knowing that I knew what I was supposed to be doing here, giving the various commands and all this kind of stuff. Then I took them on a run, and I ran until they dropped. And uh, they all looked like a bunch of just, uh, it was terrible. But anyway, got them going, and for the first, oh gosh, three, four weeks it took to get them halfway in shape. Mm -hmm. Then I had t-shirts made, and I ordered all the Army PT shorts. Back in those days, it was khaki with a little mm -hmm. slip on the front. They had all the shirts come out, and I had a black cougar. Now, I know the C Company is supposed to be Charlie, mm -hmm. but I called ours Cougar Company. Mm -hmm. And I had, there was a big, I put a big billboard right across our street entrance. And it said, Welcome to Cougar Country, and it had a great big panther like mm -hmm. cougar. Well, it's a panther, but it, yep. we told them. You couldn't cougar. call him Black Panther yeah, for obvious yeah. reasons. So anyway, I had blood dripping and all this shit. And I had pocket patches made 
like a jungle expert, passed around. Had already been to battalion, brigade, division, and got approval, and I wrote up something like an EIB test. If they could pass this test, then they get that cougar patch. And one of it was a PT test. They had a max it. And then I went through and got permission and explained to the commanding general and the brigade commander that I would be running my troops by their quarters in the morning, you know, shouting, carrying on, blah, 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 and would appreciate it greatly if they come storming out, what the hell's going on, blah, 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 you know. And uh, they went along with it, that's, you know, no problem. So, anyway, uh, I'm giving them, them, gave them all their t-shirts, they look pretty sharp on Cooper Company, first mm -hmm. platoon, second platoon, blah, blah, blah. And off we went after we got to do calisthenics, and off we went on a little run, run there, and had them really going good, sounded good with the run. We got them around that corner. I said, all right, guys, this is the commanding general's quarters up ahead. I said, I'm going to sound off like you got something. We got a pair of bang. Oh, I mean, they were screaming. The commanding general kicked that screen door. What the hell's going on? Who in the hell are you? And I says, Who are you? And they said, Come on. <laughs> All these kids that would have ordinarily probably got dishonorable discharges mm -hmm. and stuff out of, uh, gosh, I had 230, 40 of them, I don't know. I only couldn't get through to three. Mm -hmm. And I had to, you know, transfer them out. They went back into stockade. But the rest of them shaped up. I got them all promoted to PFCs, bang right off the bat, had the brigade commander, battalion commander, division commander come down and pin them. I had some of them uh, step forward and make corporals out of them. Uh, I had some that had been in a while long enough and I gave them back their sergeant stripes. And after that, we could do no wrong. We could do no wrong. Uh, it was just fantastic. Then I got my Katusa contingent you know, in with them. The Katusa is Korean Army training United States Army. And all the other total, I think we had roughly about 270, 280 men in the company, mm -hmm. something like that. Of course, we had our own 51 or 50 cal machine guns, mortars, we had all that on our own. Our section of the DMZ was to hold to allow the other side to come through. Mm -hmm and back and then we well, hold and then we fall back and stuff like that. But we ended up far apart in hell we could have held them. Mm -hmm. About that time is when um, I got my RIF notice and I went to my battalion. Well, battalion called me and I went up there and I says, yeah, you know, what? he says, uh, we need to go over this. Uh, something's come up and we need to talk about it. I said, sure. And that's when he dropped this on me and I said, is this some kind of a joke? He says, no, Fred, he says, I wish it was. And I, you know, we went through it again. And I says, well, I don't quite understand. I said, every time there's been the shit hitting the fan, I says, they call me. Mm -hmm. and every time you need to plug the gap, they call my company. Every time you want something done, you call me. And now I'm not good enough to serve in the Army anymore? I said, you asked me to be an officer. I didn't ask to be an officer. And uh, we went up to the command, well, we went to the brigade commander and up to the uh, division commander. And the division commander got on the horn and Twix back to the Pentagon, you know, have you completely lost your mind? You know, this can't be. You got a mistake somewhere. Colonel Bradley was uh, getting ready to retire. Colonel uh, Ellison, my uh, battalion commander, had been in and out of the Pentagon for a long time, knew everybody back mm -hmm. here. Bradley was going home. Ellison, out of his own pocket, went back to the Pentagon to find out what the hell is this and to get us stopped. Uh, he came back about two and a half, three weeks later, and uh, we sat down with the commanding general and him and the chief of staff. And he says, uh, Fred, he says, I don't know. He says, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't get it stopped. He says, I don't know what the hell the deal is. And we're sitting there talking back and forth. And he says, he says, just nothing made sense. I 
to them, I don't know what to do. And he says, do you know uh, an officer by the name of Barry? I said, oh, shit. and that, I came right out at that time. I said, well, <laughs> shit. I said, yeah, I says, now, I said, that explains it all. I said, what's he doing? He says, well, he just went to get, uh, he just went up to uh, West Point. He's been the super, he's been the chief of staff, deputy chief of staff of personnel at the Pentagon officer branch. I said, that explains it. And I told him what happened with me and Barry mm -hmm. and all that. One thing about Barry was back when he was in Vietnam, when I'm getting ready to train these lieutenants on how to be a briefer in the brigade, Barry was sitting there and the first one went out, blah, 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 and Barry just chewed him alive. The next guy went out, he made a mistake, and Barry ate him up. Third guy went out, blah, blah, and he just, get out, get out. And uh, he turned to Harrison. Now, Barry was on to Harrison just about every day, mm -hmm. chewing him out for mm -hmm. anything. Barry wanted to relieve Harrison so he could put his fair-haired boy, Lucas, in. Oh, See, Lucas was West Point, Harrison mm -hmm. wasn't. And uh, anyway, so the kid come out and Barry, Harrison, don't you have anybody that can brief? And I took that pointer and went right back out there. And all this is plexiglass. And this is a metal, like a little whipping rod. And Barry was facing them, not me. Everybody could see what I was doing. I wham hit that thing, and it just like a sound like a shot going off. Barry jumped three feet. He turned around. I said, "Good evening, sir." Blah 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 blah. So the corner. I said, "That concludes the briefing. Are there any questions?" Barry sat there. He says, "Now that, by God, was a briefing. That's the way we do it at the point." He says, "I can spot an academy man a mile away." And he says, "What class was you, Captain?" Says, 30, I says, I was in class of 67, sir. He said, I knew it. Well, two or three days later, I get off the helicopter, and I've been picking up wood and shit. I'm bloody all over the place. I come walking through. He's over there getting on Harrison. I said, good afternoon, sir. He turned around and didn't salute back, didn't return the salute. Harrison did. And Barry just stared at me just all the way, just to being hateful there. No, anyway, I just kept going. But years later, okay, did a little research with all the officers from Rick, from uh, Rick Gordon. Everybody that didn't get out on their own, that was not West Point, was ripped. Ben Peters got ripped off the hill. I got ripped. Five or six others got ripped. Barry. Barry stood in the third brigade top when we had all the officers mm -hmm. there for this briefing, one briefing, I don't know what it was now, and made the statement that the only really true officer was those that stood on the plane, meaning West Point. All others are temporary hire. And I'm looking around, I'm thinking, I can see five West Point, everybody else. We had about 60 officers in there. And I'm thinking everybody else is ROTC, OCS, and direct commission. I only see five or six West Points. I mean, that's how, to me, that's how much of a stupid idiot he was. But anyway, got ripped in 73. Ellison got trying to stop it. Couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've still, the way the orders run, now uh, I've got something like two and a half months before I can go home. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the way they, why they did it that way, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I got a call about two days after that, that uh, we go back up to division. So I went up to division, and in the meantime, they're scrambling around trying to find a captain to take over the company. Okay. And so I went up to division, and at this time is when they had all of this, um, fire team leader, squad leader uh, type training that they wanted to put out to everybody, small unit uh, leader, leadership training. And they had sent the, I think it's a 2765 data card, and they run them through the machine, and golly gee, mine pops out. And they wanted to know if, uh, 
you know, the experience I had, I said, yes, I was with 82nd Airborne Division. We started the, mm -hmm. the Raider Detachment and we built a bomb up. He said, well, we want the same thing here. Can you do it? And I'm looking at the chief of staff and I'm thinking, he outranks you. There's really not a whole hell of a lot you can do. We're already rift. We're out of the Army. And he says, why don't you come to dinner tonight? So I went to dinner that night with the commanding general, my battalion commander, brigade commander, was up there. And the division commander said that this is a very unique situation or problem that we have. He says, and I, I ordinarily I wouldn't even think about this, he says, but I, I need your help. And he says, you got the experience, you got this. He says, now I know that anybody else, he says, anyone would tell me to go to hell. He says, but he says, we need to get this up and running. We need this, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, I'll do it. I sat down and I wrote out, I don't know, guys, it was two, three hundred hours of lesson plans. Mm -hmm. And I could do most of it from memory from back then. Uh, got a hold of the engineers, told them exactly what we needed, how it was, blah, blah, blah. I said, you'll find it in FM 2150, whatever it is, Ranger Manual. And uh, back and forth on the obstacles and stuff. And they had that thing up and running in about three weeks. And then we, uh, we got the first class in there. Um, I don't remember what the date was, but um, anyway, gave them all, and there, here's your lesson plans, and handpicked all the NCOs to be the instructors, and handpicked the officers for tax and stuff, and uh, I turned it all over to CG, and he wrote me a glowing letter for all the good it did. Mm -hmm and uh, filed it and anyway that was it uh, i went home i uh, got ripped i had my choice of uh, reverting back and they would give me master sergeant the eight and i said no uh, i worked too hard for these so i went home and i went down to the national guard at first i, would, I didn't want anything to do with the army ever again you know you screwed me I did everything ever you ever asked me, I did it. Uh, and I just broken hearted really. But I went home and on the way home I was thinking about it. And I was on terminal leave anyway. So when I got home, I went down, seen the National Guard, and gave them the papers, and uh, boom, as soon as they're CO seen it. He called me down on Wednesday. Met on like a, time, a lot of times. Staff met on Wednesday nights, and I went down there on Wednesday night to see what you know, what the deal was. And he offered me a full time job right on the spot. He, he, says, he says I got a ranger company up in Muncie. He says that nobody knows what the hell to do with them. He says would you take them over? I said, well, what would it entail? I said, well, you, on the paperwork, you'd be the operations officer. I said, well, that's no problem. I've been doing that for years. And he says, and it's a full-time job. I thought, well, I don't have to go out and look for a job. I said, I'll take it. Well, also what that entails is when a full-time position with the National Guard or the Army Reserve, I'm not going to lose any active federal time. At this point, take number two. Okay, we've been following your military career, and now we've moved you all the way back to Indiana again. Yep. And, and you've been offered a position now with the National Guard working with a ranger company. So ranger. you can just pick that up. Yeah, company D-151, ranger company. It was in Vietnam, but now it's pretty much disbanded. It's fallen apart. And they asked me to go in as the operation officer was a full-time position and uh, get it back up to strength and all that. So anyway, we did. Or I did, and had that, and now it comes due where I am pretty much due for promotion to major. Mm -hmm. Well, there wasn't a major slot 
in the National Guard for me to go to. So they worked the deal with the headquarters 123rd Archon there in Indianapolis for me to transfer over to them uh, in a major slot, which I became the headquarters commandant of the 123rd Archon. And through that, uh, they worked a deal there to make me the full-time recruiting officer, which is full-time duty again, regular full-time job. Organized their recruiting throughout the state, all the teams they had, which you know, I'm back again, in which once again I'm not losing any active duty time. Mm -hmm. Which is all this comes into play later, which I thought was very ironic. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm there and I'm uh, I got I'm overdue for um, uh, IOAC, Infantry Officer Advanced Course. Remember what you had a few right. years before. Right. Yeah, go to the sound of the guns, mm -hmm. get shot. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, we worked it out where I went, they cut orders, I went to Fort Benning, Georgia for the IOAC. And as it turned out, it was the last nine month course of IOAC. We had guys that started after us and finished before us because they eliminated a lot of the curricula. And I'm thinking, well, what else is going to, you know, but it's nothing new. <laughs> you know, stay here long enough, everybody gets dumped on. But anyway, I uh, went through that and uh, came out uh, on a grad. The guy we had, and this was in 75, the guy we have as a guest speaker was a three-star general by the name of uh, Geisha. I almost had it. Uh, he was a Defense Intelligence Agency uh, commanding officer. He was our guest speaker. and He was talking about the needs of the Army and the officers that we need of the Army that for the future. So we're all sitting there in class A's graduation, blah, blah, blah. He went through all this stuff and everything. Now he says, fine. And now, now we got the honor graduates and distinguished graduates and all this. So he said, but the honor graduates, well, you know, they say, you know, call that Captain Freddie Goss Spalling. So I get up and walk across there, I get up to the stage and walk across. He turned to look and he looked again. He said, now this, ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly the officer, the type I'm talking about. And I had all my golly gee, nice to bend their stuff on. Now I'm walking across and, uh, and he says, where are you going from here, Captain Spalling? I said, I'm going back to Indianapolis, from there, Fort Harrison. He said, Fort Harrison? He said, that's finance. He says, you're a combat officer. I said, no, sir. I said, I got riffed three years ago, four years ago. Mm -hmm. I, says, uh, I says, I'm going back, I'm in the reserves. And he just, you know, he said, he kind of made a notation here where you're to his aide I walked over that way, going off the stage, and the aide says, you'll have dinner with us and the general tonight at the officer's club, 1900 hours of mine. I said, mm -hmm. okay. So I got in there and he asked me what, what the deal was with dinner. And I told him, I said, it's General Barry. He said, oh hell, he says, I know Sid. I thought, oh. So anyway, back and forth. The gist of it was that uh, he took my name, address, and I gave him a copy of my order so it wouldn't be that difficult to figure mm -hmm. out. Nothing, four, five, six months, then you're nothing. And then I get a letter, Department of Army, go take a physical. So I'm there at Fort Harrison, I go take a physical. I mail it back, don't hear nothing, four, five, six, seven months. Then all of a sudden, boom, get orders. Well, but this time, I'm promoted to major. The order's for captain. So I write them all out and send it back. And uh, nothing for four, five, six months. Now we're looking at you know a couple years here yeah. already, so bang here comes another set of orders, major, and I report to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I'm going back to the Patriot Forces. So I get back there, and uh, there's just no way in hell I can keep up with an 18, 19, 20 year old kid anymore. Mm -hmm. I've been sitting behind a desk too long, and I've been trying to stay in halfway decent shape, but. So anyway, uh, the way it worked out was the uh, Special Forces at that time was expanding. And they were enlarging the, the National Guard and Reserve National, or Special Forces units, and they needed guys to go out there that A, spoke a foreign language, B, Special Forces qualified, C, combat, you know, tested, mm -hmm. whatever. Well, I had a couple of A-teams, Special Forces, 
company, rifle company commanders, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, they had me, Charlie Aycock, I don't know how many others. Charlie and I go to the 1st Battalion of the 12th Space Forces out in Richard Gamar Air Force Base, Kansas, which is just south of Kansas City. And we had that battalion forever, you know. I mean, we really squared them away. Charlie was on the admin side, and I was on the operation training side. And uh, we had seven different seven different locations in five states that we was responsible so for. So when were you doing this in terms of years? This was uh, 78, 79, 80. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, uh, sent my paperwork in and I got my 20. You know, time for me to get out. I quoted Title 10, blah, 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 mm -hmm. all that. And about a month later, I get this nasty grand back. Uh, we are well aware of what Title 10 says. We will tell you when you have your 20. You do not tell us when you have your 20. I thought, well, my God, is everybody going nuts? <laughs> you know, this is ridiculous. This is 1980. I went in in 1958. Mm -hmm. I got more than 20. What's going on here? But anyway, it gets better. So. They, I get the thing of, uh, your assignment is over with here, where you want to go? And I says, well, get me back as close to Indianapolis as possible. What do you got? Because at this time, I'm already labeled in the advisory capacity, okay? So they fire me this thing, and then see, the other side of it is, I'm ready for Lieutenant Colonel. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to get the advanced course. Oh, I'm sorry, I got to get the Command and General Staff yeah. course. I'm sitting out of Richard Cabar Air Force Base. Fort Leavenworth is 30 miles away. So I'm driving back and forth, picking up the correspondence. A three-year correspondence thing I did in about eight months. Very seldom ever did I ever open the book and look. I just took the test. Mm -hmm. you know. But anyway, uh, got all that done. Uh, we got eligible to, uh, promotion to uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, and then there was not that many slots open, but they did have one 05 slot open in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. A little girl called me back and tell me, I said, I know exactly where that is, that will be fine. So I go home, which my wife was very happy mm -hmm. about that. And uh, I was the senior advisor to the, uh, the 70th Division, uh, 3rd Brigade, I believe it was. And, uh, well, they were screwed up. But anyway, sitting down there, uh, 81, 82, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I retired June 67. Uh, about. Or 87. 87. Yeah, yeah. 67. About, uh, oh gosh, when was it? February, I believe, March. Um, I'm with. Uh, the brigade commander, and he was, in a sense, uh, defrauding the government because he would cut or have orders cut. If it went through me, then I wouldn't have cut him because he was going around behind me and I didn't even know what was happening. Finally, the one little clerk come over to tell me, you know, this is what's going on, um, because he would be putting himself on active duty days and would not be in uniform working in the center, mm -hmm. he would be in his office downtown in Civi, mm -hmm. drawing full pay. And then he'd go cut orders for three weeks annual training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, where we're rotating troops through. We'd had an element there every week, rotating in the overlap. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, he was only there for one week because the other two weeks he was out at work Beach. And he's drawing the pay. But anyway, all this came out later. And I was, you know, any stuff about it, you, know, you got this, you got that. And he brought me up on charges for something, I forget what it was, uh, insubordination mm -hmm. or something, probably more than likely. But um, then, about this time, I get this nasty gram that I was defrauding the government because I had been more than 20 years in the Army. Under Title X, you're only authorized 20 years active federal service, unless you're an 06 or above, mm -hmm. which I was only 05. <sighs> I thought, boy, they got some real idiots running things nowadays. But anyway, I wrote back, I said, fine, you know, no problem. Uh, 
you know, I'd pick up the phone and try to call them. I said, hey, you know, whatever you want to do. But I kept the paperwork mm -hmm. that I notified them. I kept the paperwork that their response, and then yeah. I put this one in there. Well, then I get a call from the 5th Army IG. And uh, Colonel Travis, uh, you know, he put all kind of weird stuff in there. That uh, anyway, we had to go up in the, the, to the commanding general, Fifth uh, Army, Fort Sheridan, and I refused to ride in the same car with him. I drove my own car. And I don't mm -hmm. care what he did. But anyway, we got up there and. Uh, Spent the night, next morning, went in there, and he went in first, and there was the JAG officer, the chief of staff, the deputy commanding general, and the commanding general, and there were one or two others in there. But uh, anyway, he went in and he laid all it out, you know, and all that, and uh, then they called me in. So I went in, reported and all that, and he said, have a seat, and I sat down. Commanding General, four stars. And uh, he's sitting there, he says, mm. Colonel Travis sitting there looking at me, and oh, now, boy, we got you now. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, boy, this is why, how do the people like this get promoted? Mm -hmm. I mean, and they wonder why sometimes the reserve units are screwed up. Well, this is a good, very good example right there. But anyway, uh, General Boylan, Looked up and he says, Well, Fred, looks like you got yourself in a ringer again, doesn't it? I says, Yes, sir, it looks that way. He says, I says, What in the hell am I going to do with you? I says, I don't know, sir. I says, Probably should just discharge me. And he, we sat there and he kind of smiled. I'm sitting there looking. When General Boylan was a brigade commander in the 82nd Airborne Division, I was in the S3. Mm -hmm. Oh, home week. Mm -hmm. He got his first star, uh, and approximately a year after that, he got his second star. And then within 14 months, 15 months, he had his other two. He was four star. Mm -hmm. Bam, bam, just like that. And here he was, Fifth Army. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Anyway, he's he leaned back in the chair, and but this time, you know, Travis was looking around like, what the hell? What was that about? General Boylan says he was talking to his staff, the mm -hmm. there, the IG, the chief of staff, a couple others. He says, you know, gentlemen, said, remember the other day at lunch we were discussing? And I was telling him about this young officer that I knew, and really something boy, go get her, blah blah blah. And he went on and on and on. He said, well, this is him. He's one of the finest officers I've ever known. He turned around and he to Travis. He says, don't, he says, Fred, don't worry about this discharge thing. He says, when do you want to get discharged? It was, this was in April. I says, uh, well, sir, I came in on 25 June. I says, I'd like to go out in June. He says, consider it. He says, 30 June. He looked over whoever. He says, uh, see to it. He said, yes, sir, got it done. And he looked over at Travis. He says, Colonel Travis, your retirement date will be 31 July. He said, but, sir, I hadn't planned. He says, plan on it. He says, you're out. I went home and uh, got all my paperwork done, got all that squared away. Went out to Fort Harrison, took the last two weeks as terminal leave, went out to Fort Harrison to make sure all the paperwork and everything was done. They do an audit of your records, your finance records, to make sure everything is pays up to date, which I found that they owed me a bunch on uh, uh, vacation days mm -hmm. and a couple other things, uh, leave time and stuff. But it was kind of like poetic justice in some ways, but in other ways, you know, and there, there's many different things in the military. A lot of things that uh, that I did that others got credit for or took credit for or whatever. But I always figured that 
as long as you be true to yourself and true to the men that you're responsible for, things will work out. May not always be in your favor, but eventually it will come around. And uh, now, the way it sits, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, Staff Sergeant Gilbert put in an eyewitness statement. Staff Sergeant Esposito put in an eyewitness statement. General Harrison wrote a two-page letter of recommendation that the flying, distinguished flying cross that I got on 23 July be upgraded to the Medal of Honor. We got paperwork back from the Pentagon and all this stating that yes, they had it, was processing it under title, whatever. Uh, then here about a month ago, I got a letter from the Secretary of the Army stating that the uh, re recommendation had passed the Military Awards Board, had passed the Senior Military Review Board, and got to his desk and he, after uh, looking at everything, he had personally downgraded it to a Distinguished Service Cross. Now, never said one time as to why he downgraded it. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. But when you get to elements that high, second place isn't bad, mm -hmm. you know. But um, since that time, I've been inducted into the Infantry OCS Hall of Fame. I've been inducted as a distinguished member of the regiment of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. This coming April, I'm supposed to be inducted into the Ranger Hall of Fame. I got that in paper, I haven't gotten that whole thing yet. Uh, that was something else. But it really, it really makes no difference to me about, you know, awards and shit. Um, they're nice. And it's always a great thing to be recognized for your efforts. But the biggest thing of a professional soldier is not all the medals that you get because, you know, they're nice, they're pretty colored ribbons, they're very nice, it's all that, but they fade with age. The one thing that never fades with age and the greatest award you can ever get is the accolades that you receive from those that you serve with. Now what? I'd like to do to kind of close this out is sort of turn the tables around on you a little bit. Um, the American public often has a lot of what are probably misconceptions about American soldiers in Vietnam mm -hmm. and kind of who they were and how they acted and so forth. From your perspective, um, what's your view of the men, especially the enlisted men or the citizen soldier officer types uh, who served under you in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. How would you characterize them as a group? Well. When majority of them went over there were 18, 19, 20 year old. Physically, well, they all looked like baby Tarzans out there. Mentally, they were not prepared to see what they were going to see. And that's why you have so much of this post traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. That's why you have so much of the alcoholism. Because, you know, they don't see it anymore when they're drunk. Okay? Uh, some guys can handle it, some guys don't. We all have to handle it a different way. Uh, and I keep explaining to them, you don't dwell on it. Don't think about it. It's over with. You can't bring it back. You can't change anything. You have no say-so whatsoever on what transpired. Only thing you've got any kind of control over is what's going to happen tomorrow. And the best thing to do there is don't think about what happened yesterday. Go this way build your own new life again. What do you think determines sort of how well or poorly they performed when they were in the field? Do I know? Or what, what do you think determines what, how well they performed when they were in the field, or how well in general do you think they did? Discipline, uh, faith in your leaders. Uh, as a company commander, as a leader, you got to show them that you're not going to hide behind your captain bars. You're not going to be hiding behind you guys go out here and do this, do that. You got to go up there and show them how to do it. As long as they know you're there with them, taking the same uh, crap that they're taking, the same dangers and all, facing the same dangers, they'll follow you anywhere. Mm -hmm. If they care about you, and that comes under the same thing of they know you care about them, mm -hmm. then they'll follow you anywhere. 
like when you're going in on a, on a combat assault and you tell them, okay guys, when you get there, I'll be on the ground waiting for you. I will be on the first chopper in, I will be on the last one out, and I leave no one behind. Just that simple. All right. Well, it's been a remarkable story. I just want to close by thanking you for taking the time to tell it to me today. Ah, no problem whatsoever. Yeah.